Jumbo Jumbo and hello hello everybody a very good morning and welcome to the Masai Mara warm welcome to the CGTN Digital Safari And Jumbo Jumbo one more time and we are just by the Mara River and you can feel the current today is quite high an indication that we must have some very big rains last night from upstream my name is David and on camera with me this morning's Bungay Bungay you doing sir we're very excited great day great light and very calm weather this morning if I may say so and that's the very wide part of the Mara River. Remember we are coming to you live from the Masi Mara and that means should you have any questions, should you have any comments, you're more than welcome to send them through. Please talk to us and you can tweet to us using hashtag Wild Earth or hashtag CGTN Wild. Of all the many crossing points of this river, this is one of the widest part and more often than not, when we are lucky, we have seen many crossings going on here. So currently what we can see are crocodiles, a few stalks, some hippos like you can see on the screen there. And this gives you an idea of how deep this water is where we are now. My guess is could be between one meter to about two meters, more or less. Now, should these hippos struggle to keep the pace of the current of the water, they will definitely go to much shallow uh, areas of this river. But currently, they're just enjoying the waterfalls, just like uh, me and Bunge here. Perfect light. A rather cold morning today, 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to remain here and cross fingers that as it warms up, maybe the hippos will come out of the water, the reptiles will come out of the water, and if lucky, see some other animals crossing. A very good morning everyone. It's a beautiful morning here in the Masai Mara. My name is Isaac and on camera I have Big James. This morning I'm staying at the Mac and find the marsh lions together with lots of cats here and that's what I'm going to nothing in front of me but I, it, I do have a beautiful landscape as you can see. I don't know what's ahead of me but um, definitely I'm going to find something for you. Remember to talk to us on hashtag CGTN Wild, hashtag Wild Earth. That's where you can ask, you can interact with us. And we're going to give you a memorable morning. It's beautiful here in the Masai Mara. Just look at the landscape that I have. But before I waste more time, let me continue driving because I have nothing right now in front of me. But who knows, there could be something not very far from where I am. And that's what I'm gonna look for. As, you know, there's nothing much, uh, as I can see here, but definitely there is uh, something somewhere. Yesterday we did have a very big storm in the evening, and that's why the you know, skies have opened up. They're really blue and clear. Looks like it's going to be a very, very hot day. Yesterday it went to all, almost to 28 degrees Celsius. I think today it might exceed that. Usually when there's no clouds, it gets really, really, really hot. It is. It is you know, usually the case when you know it rains that it gets hot with the next day. I'm hoping it's going to be you know hot and animals are going to you know be everywhere. A warm welcome to all our viewers. We're currently here at Ambion and Gala now. Um, I'm gonna be your ranger this morning. I'm Nikki and with me on the camera is Khaf. 
So the area that we decided to come and stop uh, this morning is a nice and open area, but uh, there were tracks of that, of quite a big pride of lines heading down in this direction. Now we just slowed down here, stopped just to listen um, if we can hear anything. There were some hyenas calling up on this side off to our right. So what we're going to do is head straight in that area and hopefully uh, be able to find these lines. So the last tracks we had were just down here heading down towards the river. Last night the wind was blowing quite hard. It might be that the lines could have gone down to the river uh, bed to go and lie down in there to get out of the wind. We don't know. We'll just have to give it a go. Hopefully we can find them this morning. But it is incredible just to be able to head out early this morning um, to go and look for these animals. And it's almost like whenever you do go on a drive, it's a whole new chapter, a whole new adventure each and every day. Absolutely. Every day is a new day when you go out on safari and lions will take any cover just to hide either any bushes just to make sure they're not spotted. If we would have any lions here, we have seen when the wildebeest will want to cross the river, all zebras will see lions taking cover and hiding uh, by the bushes just along the river. So what would happen, they're always very patient and they wait for these animals to come. They cross, if maybe there are about a couple of hundreds of them, they come crossing, 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 and the lioness or the lion lay, lay ambush and very slowly just come so close and then maybe just decide uh, to attack. Well, for now or at the moment, we haven't seen any lions as yet. We haven't seen any wildebeest as yet, but we're just going to stay here, very patiently wait, and and uh, see what happens because out here we get so many surprises. We could be having such a quiet moment because if you look to the back of that waterfall, there's a huge stock there. I'm sure uh, Bungay, who is on camera today, is going to show us that stock. That stock's just fitting, and that's a yellow build stock. And maybe the next minute it will disappear. But then behind those bushes, we might just see a cat coming out walking. It could be a cheetah, it could be a leopard, it could be a lion, it could be a lioness. So just patiently waiting at any one point once you're out in the African wilderness can give you surprises at any time. Now, the Maasai Mara has a number of rivers, but this is the main river that we call the Mara River. And we have seen the wildebeest and the zebras crossing all these rivers. But apparently the Maasai Mara River or the Mara River is most important because it's here where sometimes we see hundreds of wildebeest and zebras crossing and we are going to see more of the same. From the southern plains of the Serengeti, over a million grazers move northwest through the western corridor, gathering along the banks of the Grumeti River. Once the chaos of the rut comes to an end, the herds gallop north once again. In time, more than two million animals amount to feast on the abundance the Mara has to offer. But the reward of the red oat grass does not come easy. The zebra vanguard is the first on the banks, taking the plunge into the treacherous Mara River in order to reach the untouched long grass plains on the other side. Not only must they face the turbulent waters, but also the crocodiles gliding through the rapids in anticipation. Then comes the body of the migration, the thundering herds of the white-bearded wildebeest, with their bleeds echoing through the landscape while in search for greener pastures hunger, so too are the lions of the Mara who patrol the banks of the river. The risks are known, but the herds are determined. All must make the leap. Some will fall, but for the survivors, the lush greenery that awaits is bountiful. And then, as is nature's way, it comes the time to cross the river again as they continue to follow the life-giving storms and nourishing plains.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back live to South Africa. The migration is a spectacle that if you've never seen before, it is very well worth going and having a look. I was very lucky to have been there last year. And, uh, well, it's just very hard to explain if you've never been in amongst the masses, the smell, the noise, the flies are next level. Anyway, talking about flies and talking about overwhelming things, I found something here on the floor, which is um, quite interesting for the most part, but it is a story of a toilet, a story of poo, and the story of a small, medium-sized omnivore called a civet. And now this is what we call a civet tree. Well, it's quite large, extends all the way around where I'm here, and it's a seasonal deposit of dung. What's that? can hear some elephants. Eh? Elephant tummy rumble somewhere nearby. I heard that. I'm going to follow up on some elephants soon because there's only one animal, to be honest, that's got a bigger poo than a civet, and that's an elephant. But amazing, a civet that only stands about this high off the ground has got such enormous dung. And you'll notice I'm using a stick because I'm not going to be prodding around in this. Um, there are shells, or should I say millipede scales, rings, there's fur, fur over there because they are omnivores, they'll eat some meat, they'll eat some some mammals if they can, I don't know what mammals they catch but there's lots of fur over there um, and there'll be lots of berries and fruit, there's some seeds over here, grass seeds, so a very seasonal sort of diet that the civet has and this is a territorial boundary so the civet will walk here and he'll defecate here regularly and it's basically indicating to all the other civets his strength, his size, and his uh, occupation of the area. So it is quite something to look at, but very, very important signposts out in the African wilds. Animals use smell a lot for communication. Um, they like to put things down that tell everybody else that I'm here, and it saves a lot of energy. Because if you do put down a signpost that says, I'm available, or I'm occupied, people tend to leave you alone, or other animals of the same species. Without doing this, there'll be a lot more conflict, a lot more injury, and potentially even more death. Uh, so by doing this, they avoid a lot of conflict, although it might seem like quite a big thing to do. They just make sure that they keep their bowel movements for specific times of the day. Okay, a marvelous tale of the small and interesting out in the wilderness, and BK heard some elephants. Let's go see if we can maybe find the elephants, because there's nothing nicer to start off a day than a herd of eddies. So we were talking earlier about um, smells and or how animals can use uh, different smells. Now, in this open area that we went through, we came across a very interesting site. Now, if you just drive past, it looks like a flat um, area with a couple of, looks like a bit of antelope dung that's scattered across here. But this is such an interesting place to be because at the moment, um, there's quite a few tracks here of what looks like wildebeest. Now, often with the wildebeest, especially a male, um, when it becomes, or when it's dominant, it will often have an area, a territory, that belongs to um, that particular wildebeest. Now, how it would mark it, of course, it would defecate, sometimes rub its head through the soil, even use its uh, uh, hooves. And so you'll notice with, with wildebeest, they have these glands between the hooves. So what they'll do is they'll basically push the hoof into the sand like this and then rub it like this in order to get their scent across, but also with the dung. So this here would probably be something like a dung bed. And so this is one spot where they'll often come down, probably lie down here um, during the evening, and eventually in the day he'll start moving again. But there's quite a few tracks here. I can just imagine he would have uh, lied down here. We didn't see any wildebeest, so this might be a good sign because of those lines that we are looking out for, that they probably came past this area, and that's why they're not here. So we're going to carry on in this direction, and hopefully... Um, it's a good sign we could possibly find these lines. I'm hoping. Keep our fingers, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, I think let's probably see if we can um, find these lines. Good uh, 
Well, Nikki, and good luck, and hopefully you're going to find some lions. Now, you remember Ali told you as it warms up, these amphibious animals here will try or will try to come out of the water and warm up. So we've got this one hippo here trying just to come to the surface of the water and basically get a bit of sun because it's very cold where it is. Look at it and see how it blends in very well. Oh, there are two of them there. Now, we have known hippos to mate in the water. We have known them to give birth in the water. And I'm wondering what is in front of it. Is it a hippo? Is it pushing away a crocodile? Yeah, I'm trying to think it's pushing away a croc there. Rarely we get them having issues when they're in the water. Yes, that's a croc to me. And they are not uh, getting along very well. Once in a while, we have seen hippos going for crocs and crocs going for hippos. Of course, we know hippos are herbivores and crocs are carnivores. But should, maybe, if this is a female, feel a little uncomfortable and she got a young one, we have seen uh, these reptiles eating uh, the baby hippos. And I'm sure maybe if this is a female, she could be just feeling not right with this croc being very close to her you know, baby and maybe uh, she's pushing it away. Still can't stop, still moving away. It's very interesting because hippos normally will have big groups where they stay together and I think she is like, go away, we don't want you so close to us. Oh, it's a baby hippo rather. Yeah, it looks like a baby hippo. So it could be a plaything between her and the mother. Yeah, it's a baby hippo. Two babies maybe. I was just seeing the head and the nose. And either the mother is trying to show the youngster how to survive in the water. We all know hippos do not swim in the water. So they just walk through. And because they can't also float, maybe they're just being taught the ropes by the mother. This is exactly what you do for survival. And because they're just moving against the current a little bit. You see, always they try to keep the eyes on top, ears, and if you look at the eyes, the nostrils and the ears, they're always at the same par, slightly above the water. But once in a while, you'll get the hippos way inside, and every three, five minutes, they'll just pop up to breathe and then back in the water. Welcome back to South Africa, everybody, in Juma. Well, we've got a herd of elephants here, but uh, they're being a little bit shy and moving away from us. We're not going to push them. They don't want to be on camera for some reason. It's possible that the wind yesterday has unsettled them. Let me just move forward a little bit here and get through that bush. So we're not going to follow them. Just a little gap over here. There we go. The African or savanna elephant, everybody. Such an important species in the system. Occurring in sort of loose small groups to large groups you sometimes might find them in enormous accumulations or aggregations but invariably they break up into these smaller groups of four or five maybe ten elephants a few big females with their successive years of offspring that one there is probably a female with um, individuals of different ages and it's very likely that she's also pregnant so we have a quiz for you this morning Elephant quiz. I wonder if you're all ready for something to make the brain work in the morning. Now, elephants are mixed feeders and they use their teeth 
for grinding down the vegetation. Now I wonder how, if you can tell me out there by sending through your answers to hashtag wild earth or hashtag CGTN, how many molars does an elephant, now African elephant, get in their lifetime? How many molars? There's a specific number. Let us know. Those are the grinding teeth inside the mouth. They get them at different ages. They get the first one, and then the first ones push forward as the second pair come from the back. And they actually sort of push out the front of the mouth, as it were, until the final one has come through. Now, how many molars is that? The way in which the teeth grow in the elephant's mouth is a very good indication of its age. If you find an elephant's skull, you can actually work out the age to within two years. Oh, it's giving his bum a scratch. Oh, look at that. That poor termite mound. Try to spend another moment with these ellies, but it seems like they want to move off into the thickets. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to and beyond Pinda Private Game Reserve. I'm just thinking or listening to the elephants that Steve's busy watching. There's definitely nothing better than a scratch, a good scratch when it hits the spot. My name is Grant and behind the camera this morning we've got Craig and uh, we have come out to where, well the, the area where we left that cheetah yesterday afternoon and we've come to see if we can find her again. Now as some of you may remember she did have um, a little bit of a belly on her. There was actually a question about whether or not she was pregnant um, but I I did explain yesterday that I think it is because she had eaten recently, so she was still busy digesting a meal. So we've just come across these water buck uh, on our way into the area, and we thought we'd spend a little bit of time with them and just watch and listen. Perhaps we can find some clues as to where that cheetah might be, because it's very possible that she she moved late evening yesterday to find a very uh, a suitable. Sorry about that. To find a quiet and safe place to rest. So we are quite close to quite a big watering hole, one of the last remaining watering holes on Pinda, and which is why we find these water back here. They are water dependent, um, and they're never too far from water. It's always interesting to see those shaggy necks, um, and they need that extra bit of fur because. Craig and I noticed as we were as we were descending from Pinda Mountain Lodge, which is quite high up on a, on a, on, a, on the side of a mountain. As we were descending to the lower lying areas where the river is and where this waterhole is, you can immediately start to feel uh, the cold as it starts to get cooler as you start to drop lower, and so they need that extra bit of fur on their around their necks to keep them warm. Those perfect, perfect white rings around their bums. It's quite nice to see that they are relaxing again and they're going back to feeding. I love waterbuck. Megan, thank you. I also love waterbuck. I love all animals, um, but it's always, yeah, I had a, I had a guest once tell me, um, do you know what my favorite animal is? And I said, what is it? And he said, it's the one I'm looking at right now. So basically he was saying any animal is his favorite animal as long as he's looking at an animal. And I, I really appreciated that, uh, that comment. So thanks for yours as well. 
See, they popped their heads up there. There was a, a sound. We are going to investigate the area here, see if we can maybe find any signs or pointers that might lead us to where that cheetah might have gone. Hello and welcome back and look what is here. Found three young lions. I cannot identify them. I think they're part of the marsh pride on the triangle side. Don't get confused about this. They're quite a distance away and this is an off-road area so I'm sticking to where I am and I'll be watching them to see what they're doing. It's quite early and the grass is quite wet and so they are not moving very much. You can see they're quite far away from where I am but there is one that is quite active. The one to the right looks like he's a young male about three years old I would say. The two to the left could be her sisters. The one in front uh, or in the middle looks like it might be moving soon by the looks but I can't say exactly what they're, you know, they're gonna be doing. The one to the left, you can tell, it's starting to clean itself. So it means they might be, have been moving earlier on quite a lot in the winter morning dew and they are wet. Looks that like they are very alert at the same time. So if something passes by, we could get lucky and see them go for breakfast. Remember, this is coming live for, you know, from the beautiful Masai Mara, Mara Triangle in Kenya. Okay, he just decided to take a nap. I don't know what to do now. But this is beautiful, guys. You know, I have, hadn't seen lions yesterday. And um, it's my first sighting of the day. Beatrice, um, thank you for your question. You asked, you know, how many prides are there in the triangle? Every year it changes. Last year we had about six. This year we have witnessed about, about uh, this is swamp pride. We have seen the, uh, the, the Mogoro pride. We have seen the Owinos, the, um, the sausage tree pride, and uh, the salt lake pride. And there is also Purugat pride. So there is about seven prides still and they haven't changed uh, the names, but what has changed is the numbers. We are not seeing the exact numbers we saw last year. Some of them are more, like the Owinos and the Mugoro are still the same. The, this uh, Marsh Pride, they are less, uh, they're not as many, and also we haven't seen the Olololo Pride, which were about 18. So in total, we're seeing about six Prides. There could be more. But since we're always broadcasting and seeing them every day, we'll be able to confirm if the Ololoro Pride you know, comes back, which will make it to seven prides. But at the moment, we have six prides. That female did you know, wake up and stretch a little bit, then lie down. I can see their heads are turning quite a lot, which means there could be something they are hearing in the long grass. So... I don't know if they're going to be moving. This is a beautiful section of the marsh. See the different type of trees. This one with lots of branches and leaves, you know, has been underbrowsed really nicely. Look at that. That is the work of the giraffes. See how quickly they can disappear if you didn't know what you were looking for. If they lie down, they just quickly can disappear just in front of your eyes. I'm gonna stick here for a little bit longer, see if they do something. Yes, indeed, well, lions can disappear and so can elephants. I mean, look at that. You know, back here with us in Juma in the woodlands where the elephants have moved off a short bit and are feeling quite comfortable now with our presence. But we're not going to press or go any closer. They were moving away from us, so we're going to leave it like that. But uh, the elephants, it's a non-stop feeding frenzy from the day they're born. Or should I say, from the day they're born, they drink milk when they are hungry, and they learn how to use that trunk. But after the first year and a half, two years, feeding becomes a 
necessity all day long. You'll see elephants taking that trunk and just putting food in their mouth. And uh, what happens is that their teeth actually get worn down. And obviously this has worked over a very, very long time that they go from one, their first set of molars to a second and then a third obviously comes through. And I know there's a few answers that have come through with regards to how many sets of molars does an elephant erupt in their life. And I think Cheeks said three. Cheeks, that's, that's halfway there, halfway there. Judy, I think, said 24. Judy, that's way too many. That's way too many. Um, and I can't remember. Alaramua, I think Alaramua said six. Now, right in the middle there, Alaramua, number six is indeed the correct answer. What happens is that elephants will go through a period where one set of molars gets worn down and at that right time the enamel gets worn down from the vegetation, the sticks, the grass and eventually another one is pushed forward from the back almost like a like a stack of dominoes. They push forward and then the front molar actually is sort of pushed out of the mouth entirely. Um, and it's a, it works in stages obviously, it takes time. You know you've grown teeth before, they don't just pop out. So it pushes and pushes and pushes and then the first set of molars gets removed, the second one gets replaced by the third one and eventually at about the age of between 40 and 45, the sixth set of molars erupts in the elephant's mouth, pushing out the last fifth one and then once that molar, that set of molars has been wild or ground right down to a smooth finish, the elephants start to really struggle to break down their food. And it's why you'll find old elephants hanging around in very sort of riverine riparian areas where the vegetation is very soft, lots of sedges, lots of soft juicy grass, stuff that's very easily chewed and it doesn't require too much in the way of uh, chomping with the mouth to be ingested and then thus digested. So old elephants, due to the fact that their teeth wear down to that point, actually, when you look at their dung, you can find in the dung almost completely unbroken up particles. The leaves, the sticks, everything that comes out in the dung almost looks like you were in your garden and you raked up a pile of leaves and sticks. That is what an old elephant's dung looks like. And then slowly over time, they will lose condition, lose weight, and you'll see the skin starting to sort of wrap around the bones as the muscle and body weight disappears. And then eventually those animals will succumb to sort of poor condition and old age. So many researchers have uh, looked at elephants that they've put collars on and they can actually put molds in the mouth a fluoride mold which then obviously takes an imprint of the, the dental structure and with that, with animals that are being researched, they can figure out its age to within about two years. Well done. I mean, I, I, I like when uh, Steve Ovo talks about elephants. He is very vast about elephants. And apparently we haven't seen researchers following the hippos because as he says, we have seen, you know, people uh, putting on collars to animals like elephants, hyenas, lions, but not sure why nobody has bothered to uh, research on hippopotamus. And my guess would be because those collars normally have a small little chip or like small little uh, gadget for or data to be followed. It could be very tricky to have one gadget that could be uh, waterproof. And talking about the dentition of elephants, we're looking also at hippos. Hippos got very huge canine teeth and more so to the males because that is what they use to fight to defend their territories. If you look at the canines, especially of the fully grown uh, bulls, there could be anything close to two feet. And the whole idea here is for them to fight if need be. There could be an intruder or another male coming to try and sneak in. 
because in every group of hippos of anything from 20 sometimes up to 100 depending on the habitat and of course availability of food you'll get there'll be one dominant bull his main work is of course to protect the cows and her calves because the single bull that will be dominant in a group for example this one here he has all the mating rights he would tolerate you know once in a while some adult males and once they are big enough he'll definitely uh, show them the door and then they're going either to form their own group or they'll go to another area so the group you're seeing here is always resident here and it remains here like all around the year it doesn't go anywhere they of course come out uh, say at dusk to go and graze and in the water the hippos are very territorial but once out at dusk going to graze you'll get everybody takes a different direction for feeding and they feed solitary As it warms up, you'll get some more of them coming out of the water. Just enjoying listening to the current. Defian, you'd like to know if the current would pull uh, the baby downstream. Not really. You'll be surprised. I'm going to show you where we have the biggest current uh, of this river here. And what happens is the hippos are very intelligent animals. Anybody who takes water as a habitat must learn how to survive. And the mothers will not allow their young ones to be in any place that is very deep or where the current is very fast. We haven't seen that happen unless maybe the calf could be sick or something could be wrong with it. But the mothers will always make sure the position they take in the water, it has the right depth, it's comfortable, and the current is not as fast look at those hippos, hippos there look at the heads there see the current there is not as heavy and they got their nostrils their eyes their ears above the water and that's how the hippos are designed so that they can keep the whole body under the water to cool off now if these hippos here would be having small little calves with them you'll get they'll put them on the edge of the river not exactly where they are because that area to me is quite deep could be a meter a meter and a half and of course because the calves will need to breathe once in a while they'll just make sure they put them on the edge where it's not very deep Remember, ladies and gentlemen, comments and questions are always very welcome. And you can tweet using hashtag CGTN World or hashtag World Earth. Kids, we haven't forgotten you. We love to hear from you. And you can do that by sending us emails, kids questions at worldearth.tv. I'm not sure the Bunga is seeing a crocodile there somewhere. Bunga is the gentleman on the camera this morning. And I think to the far left, he has seen a crocodile, I guess, but pretty small one. And it blends in, it just looks like a log. And definitely as it warms up, we'll get most of these reptiles coming out of the water. Enough. levels of this river do not affect the crossing you'll be surprised that when they will be will choose to cross the things they do not consider they do not look at the levels of the water and they do not look at the gradient of the crossing point they just all push the river they have a huge build-up and they just go regardless of the depth I mean once in a while we have seen them crossing on uh, you know in the water or in this river at a depth of only about two feet you know when the water is very low look at uh, imagine the height of your knee that will be the level of the water we have seen them just coming crossing and boom they go 
they choose certain crossing points like where we are now this we call this one the main crossing point and when the currents are very high you'll get the river is about three meters deep and they just plunge in they disappear in the water they push because they know they have to come out on the other end and they come out and it's at those crossings where we end up seeing so many mortalities I'm still very hopeful that the dynamics here where we are are going to change later and as a result I'm remaining here. Thanks Gigi, I hope you get to see a crossing today. There's really quite a spectacle. Well, we've caught up with a young elephant bull who was giving us a nice sort of bit of body language for a moment and I decided, as with the rest of the herd, that he's rather going to go off into the thickets. Quite amazing everybody how this is going to transform itself for the next few weeks. On the verge of spring, less than a month until spring. And all the trees around here are going to start blooming. Leaves are going to start popping out and flowers. Hello Kathy, you want to know how much an elephant weighs at birth? And it's about 110. 100 to 110 kilograms, about 200 to 220 odd pounds. It's a very heavy little animal. And they are very small when they're born. And with a gestation period of nearly two years, 22 months in the mummy's tummy. And when you see them born, they are the smallest little things. But, but bear in mind that they are also standing next to mum. Oh, most of the my biggest friends weigh that. So you can imagine that at birth in a very small little package. It just goes to show how solid the bone structure is. And obviously elephants have a very long gestation period so that they can, the baby is a little bit more developed at birth. And uh, little baby elephants are able to get up within the first five to ten minutes. And the herd moves quite slowly with them at first. But from an early age, they need to keep up with the herd. But it is baby elephants that dictate the movements of breeding herds. So it sets breeding herds apart from uh, big bulls. Big bulls are really, really big. And being a very big animal means that you feed on bulk, of course, but you don't need the same quality in food. The energy requirement is lower. So big bulls can afford to hang out in areas of bulk food that's quite nutrient poor. Whereas breeding herds of elephants need to move in response to their youngsters' desires or needs from an energy point of view. First of all, they need to provide milk for the babies. And the small elephants need to feed on very nutrient-rich food. And so breeding herds' movements are definitely very seasonal. They move in response to nutrients, in response to the rains. They'll always feed on the best available grass that they can and flowers and fruits as well. And so their movements are curtailed by the youngsters. And obviously they can also only move so far every day because of the ability of the youngsters to move. Whereas bulls, well, they just move off and just take it very easy. This is one young bull who's sort of hanging around on the periphery of the herd. He's too cool to hang out with the youngsters. So he's finding his own meal on the outskirts, but still staying in sort of enough of an earshot in case mum needs him. Good morning everyone for a beautiful day here at Swala Kalahari. Um, 
David on camera is always just doing a fine, fine, fine job there, making art out of this incredible landscape. And my name's Dylan. Um, I believe you're looking at the bottom of an elephant or an elephant's bottom, either. Or <laughs> whichever way around it is, it sounds like you guys are having some like really, really good sightings with our colleagues there. Nonetheless, it is fantastic having you with David and myself, as always. I'm really, really sorry. We have been like having tech issues the past couple of afternoons. It seems to be a heat-related thing in electrical components. That's why we've been on in the mornings, but not in the afternoons. Anyway, we are back and up and running. Hopefully, we'll hold thumbs. David will be checking it like early every afternoon, so we know if we're actually going to be going live or not. Um, but anyway, it was what a sighting we had here yesterday, that, those cheetah. And um, yeah, they, they, just to go out on a morning drive like that, not expecting anything, you know, just going out and enjoying the morning, having a good, and then next thing, oh, there's a cheetah with four cubs. That was an incredible sighting. Um, anyway, we sat with him for quite a long time and there was no, no activity further. But yeah, good news as always. And it's the first thing I check every single morning when I get to this particular dam is are all the Shelby's still there? And they are so far. But if you think that, that of that attrition rate, eh, we're down to four chicks from nine. So that's, a, that's quite a, you know, uh, you know, you'd normally be happy if you have a 50% survival rate on, a, on, on youngsters out in these environments. Oh, look at the meerkats. There were five youngsters and we're down to two youngsters. You know, um, so we're actually going to head up there. Veronica, I'm making a bit sure to did locate them yesterday. So we are going to be heading up that way now. It'll take us, like, we'll like kind of amble around on the way there because it's quite cool. So it'll take a little bit of time for them to come out. Well, Chelsea Blue has asked a, a really interesting question in terms of the behavior of ducks. And the question is that would different duck species interact if they were together at the same dam? Yes and no. So uh, if, if you look at, let's take Egyptian geese, and and they are ducks. Don't jump up and down, Egyptian geese are ducks. So you come here and you've got these South African shell ducks, you've got Egyptian geese here, and they're at the same dam. If it's a massive dam, it's a big water body, okay? And there is plenty of food for everyone. Everyone kicks the heels up, relaxes, chills out, swims around, dabbles, eats some food, grazes some grass, comes back, grows chicks. Everyone lives happily ever after, okay? On a dam this size, okay, if you had a pair of Egyptian geese that had to pull in you now, there would be a boxing match of note because a dam this size cannot support two pairs of, two pairs of, um, two pairs of large ducks like that. The, 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 and, I, and, I, and I stand to correction this. I think the figures are like about half a hectare per shoreline for, a shell, for shell ducks at high densities. I mean, th this dam itself isn't even half a hectare. This is a tiny, tiny, tiny little ephemeral water body. So this will drop. So this cannot support um, two large pairs of ducks. You've got this little dab chick that's floating around in the middle of you. Oh, they just got underwater. Thank you, dab chick. Well done. It's a, a little grebe for those of you. Okay, so David did get him. Good job. Um, so even these ducks end up chasing this little grebe around sometimes. Not because there's a huge amount of competition. Remember, he's actually foraging for water, mostly for like larger water insects. They're going for smaller, uh, you know, like, uh, invertebrates in the water, but more like vegetation and that. The shell ducks. So there's not a huge amount of competition. But nonetheless, anything that they even think vaguely could be a threat to these ducklings they'll go for. Dave and I had such a laugh the other day, we watched um, uh, Sheldon, the male, the one with the gray head, chasing a dove for probably 600 meters. He took off chasing this dove and he went full out for it. That dove just managed to keep ahead of the shell duck. And I think what was going on there, remember we've been having youngsters missing in that, and I think it may be that he was thinking that that, that dove, because they do look very similar to um, Gabar goshawks in some ways, so he might have just thought it was a raptor or something. But no, you, you can get in very intense competition between duck species at the same dam in certain situations. Well, welcome back to the Masai Mara, and I have more for you. 
here looks like one happy big breeding herd lots of females could be sisters could be cousins and their you know offsprings and previous offsprings the family structure of elephants is made up of matriarch her sister her sisters and their daughters in areas where there's abundance of food areas like here you find they would have two to three sisters and their previous offsprings maybe two or three with their you know little um, calves so it could be one big extended family and can range from 12 to around 30 all of them yes very closely related they do help in bringing up each other's young the you know you know previous siblings and aunties we call them allo aunties where sometimes you will find the adults grazing or browsing at a distance but the previous offsprings taking care of the young ones it is very typical to see that and over here they are eating you know croton dachogamus it is a very pepperish and also very it has very flaky leaves but it is loved by elephants apart from that there is many bushes that they can eat here you can tell that they are very full they've been eating well constantly feeding for up to around 80 20 hours it is an eating machine they will eat up to around a quarter ton of food every day and drink lots of water almost you know 200 liters a day for fully grown ones here the weight of the females i would say the big ones here would be a good maybe four tons it's four times my land rover and looks like they are heading off into the bushes maybe for a, a well-deserved shrub that is in there the only one that knows could be the oldest female because she is much more experienced she remembers many many things up to around 40 years back when she was taken on a tour maybe by her mother or auntie previously so she will take them you know there and it is an automatic imprint to everyone that is existing now that whatever they're going to find and whatever the female is taking them to the matriarch i mean they will remember it for as long as they live it is interesting that this animal at the start of the 19th century the it, you know, it was estimated it was over maybe 500,000 in africa but now it has been reduced to almost around 200,000 it is shocking so it is nice to see these many this time and day the one good thing about them is they have memories so when they go towards where one was you know hurt either by sh being shot being speared they will move hastily out of that area because they know it is a dangerous area also they can be very cheeky i've seen them go towards villages that are, that are very close to the park and where they're growing maize they come very quietly and eat very quietly but sometimes they make a mistake and they make some noise and they're hard and when they attack a farm they can eat quite a lot and damage a lot of you know you know crop Welcome back everyone to and beyond Pinda. We've managed to find a really large herd of buffaloes just moving through the grassland here. Now this herd um, was apparently in the area yesterday after we had left that female cheetah and so we've checked quite thoroughly for her where we 
we thought she she might be. Uh, there's a big watering hole that I mentioned earlier with the, the, one of the last remaining ones, and these buffaloes were close to that. So we thought that maybe these buffaloes came across that cheetah and tried to chase her away. So we are still out in the, in the grassland and we're gonna just keep checking around here to see if there's any sign of it, but we'll enjoy these buffaloes. For now you can see they really spread out. There's lots and lots of them. I think there's maybe close to 70 or 80 buffaloes here. See the white speck there, that's a cattle egret. Is it hitching a ride? It looks, looks like it's hitching a ride there. Oh no, they're on the ground. They're on the ground, so they're, they're following this herd of buffaloes. Because as the buffaloes move through the, the long grass, they flush out little insects and those cattle egrets are able to catch the insects. How many buffalo make up a herd, Susie? Uh, so it, it depends. Uh, there can be, I mean, there's, there's herds of, I've seen a herd of about 200, but I've heard of people seeing herds of 400, 500 buffaloes. More typically here on, on Pinda, we see smaller groups, maybe 20 to 30 buffaloes, but what the herd is, is made up of is actually smaller family units and they sometimes split off and do their own thing. It's almost similar to, to elephants but uh, in this herd there will be a number of uh, big dominant bulls uh, and then also some um, matriarch sort of role cows and so long and short, well, there is no short answer to your question, but uh, there is no set size of a herd. So, but family groups will stick together. So usually uh, maybe a female and her sister will stay together with their calves and uh, they will move together. And then sometimes th their, their closest relatives will, they'll all stick together and then maybe move and, and, and choose their own direction. And sometimes the herd will splinter up but uh, more especially in areas where there are large predators like lions that, that actually hunt the buffalo, um, they will congregate in much larger numbers. And uh, here, the, the lions don't seem to hunt buffaloes. That's not to say that they can't. And so the buffaloes are typically in smaller groups here. So this is actually quite a large group to see this many buffaloes all together on, on Pinda. Also in the drier times when they start to lose their, their fitness um, because of the amount of nutrients in the grasses that they're feeding on, they might feel a little bit more vulnerable. They might have to move bigger distances to get good grazing and then move all the way back to, to get water. So they're spending a lot of time and energy uh, moving and when they move, that's when they're most at risk because they might walk across something like a pride of lions. So especially now when they have to travel big distances to and from water, they, they do, we, we do tend to see them congregating into larger herds. See there's quite a nice mix of shapes and sizes, there's some old bulls, there's some nice young calves, some cows in amongst the herd as well. And there's also, if Craig goes a little bit to the right, there's one wildebeest, just like that, <laughs> that wildebeest in, I think it's in Juma that's trying to follow, well that is following the elephant herd. Maybe he's considering joining this buffalo herd. It's a really peaceful morning out here, especially after yesterday's wind. And all the animals have come out, uh, I suppose, in 
and excitement for how perfect today is. There's not a breath of wind. It's a little bit overcast, so it's cool. Um, I don't think it's going to get too hot, maybe if this cloud cover burns off. But we're going to stick in this area and see if we can find that cheetah. I just repositioned a little bit from the same place I've been before along the Mara River because one huge, I would guess, male crocodile has come out of the water and look at his size. Now, what is interesting if you look at him carefully, look at the tail and see how it's being swung, you know, left, right, right, left by the water. And he doesn't seem, I don't know whether he is conscious of that. I'm calling him a male because of his size, and he is rather dark. Now look carefully on his mouth, and you'll see the teeth are all out. Not all of them, but most of the teeth, you can see them. When we look at some differences between reptiles in the world, this is always a very significant difference between crocodiles and alligators. When crocodiles shut their mouth like this one here, some of the teeth will remain outside the mouth, whereas when alligators shut their mouth, you do not see a single tooth. His eyes are closed, and I cannot tell for a fact whether he is having a nap or just resting. I mean, he just came out of the water and look on the carapace, look on the under part of this reptile here, and you notice he doesn't have the scales like on the upper part of the body. They look slow, they look very harmless, but you do not want to take chances uh, with these reptiles here. Anything would happen very quickly. I'm wondering how the water just splashing on his mouth and he doesn't seem bothered by that, not an inch. TikTok, how often do crocodiles mate? Now, of course, depending on the group, depending on when the females are in season, it has been very difficult for us to know when they met because we even rarely see them meeting. And my guess is maybe they met in the water or maybe they met outside the water when, you know, in the darkness at night. But it's very difficult, TikTok, to give you an exact answer on how often they met. But the most interesting story is after they met, and the female coming out of the water and she digs herself a nest by the riverbank, lays the eggs in there and then covers them. They have a very interesting uh, story, TikTok, because unlike the other animals where we get the chromosomes uh, deciding the sex of the babies that will come out once they hatch out from the eggs, the Babies of crocodiles, males and females, it's determined by the temperature of the nest. Now the eggs that tend to be on top of the nest, depending on the heat, they normally come out as male crocodiles and the eggs below will come out as female crocodiles. It's one interesting fact about crocodiles, unlike all the other animals where we have the chromosomes X and X uh, for females and X and Y for males. Crocodiles and some teat, uh, I would say turtles, sea turtles, the sex of their babies is determined by the temperature. It's the white part of the Mara River, and you can see in the background there is one escarpment that we call the Oler escarpment. And having seen one crocodile come out, I got a feeling we'll be seeing a few more also do the same. So 
Thanks, Gigi. Good luck along the river there. I hope you get some action this morning. You are back with us here in Juma Private Game Reserve. Yes. And we are at one of the watering holes. Just animals come down to drink, but they didn't stick around. Animals are quite tentative when they come down to the water to drink because, well, as you saw, they are crocodiles in many watering sort of places around the, the continent. I've never seen one in this particular watering hole. This is Treehouse Watering Hole. They've had hippos here before. I haven't seen a crocodile here, but you never know. So animals, when they come down to the water, are always very careful. Because although crocodiles do feed almost primarily on fish, as you see the big giants in the Mara, they feed on migrating wildebeest and zebra. There we go. There's a little, sorry about the aerial. There is a grey go-away bird. You might have heard him a moment, a moment ago. Quay. Quay. He's coming down to drink as well. Being a seed eater and a fruit eater. And this is also a bird that's eating at the moment almost exclusively, I would say, the flowers of the knobthorn and the other acacias little flower blossoms. Now birds of prey are a big threat to these birds when they come down to drink so you'll often find them coming down quite slowly often in groups and then also often sit on the edge on a little thorny tree before going down because birds of prey will take opportunity to hunt these birds. If you're small sparrowhawks and goshawks, falcons, they can come out of nowhere. High speed flying. Talking about birds of prey, BK. I think I might have one for us. You see that big marula over there? A the big one. I think just by looking with my binoculars that we might have the first Wahlberg's eagle back. The one on the left. Sorry, the one on the left. Yeah, left of that one. There we go. Down the left. There on the Oh, am I in the right tree? Sorry, I think I'm in the wrong tree. Yeah, sorry, can you go right, eh? And at 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, there we go, you see here? Or top right. Top right, 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 right. The tree to the right, peaks. There we go, that one, middle of frame. I think we might have our first Warburg's eagle back, everybody. Yes, indeed. Now that is a migratory bird that moves back down into South Africa for breeding. They are called intra-African migrants. They don't go too far north and they come back here and then they spend the time looking for food and getting ready to mate and to breed. And we've had resident, two resident pairs of Wahlberg's eagles for quite some time. And you can see on the back of his head, he's got a little bit of a crest. It stands up a little bit. It's not that clear. We'll try and get a bit closer for you. Is quite far away, but uh, there we go. Yes, indeed. What a wonderful shot! <coughs> Past the Knobthorn Acacia. Well, how wonderful! I believe that is the first Wahlberg's eagle to return back which is a very good sign for the coming of spring. Well, I'll be ambient pinned everyone, while still sitting with this herd of buffaloes. And they are slowly grazing and moving along we have seen one or two of them actually lie down. So it seems that they've already had a drink maybe early this morning at the little water hole that we went to check at. And uh, they've moved off to start grazing for the day. 
there's a few really nice sets of horns there. And you see that one in the, just to the left of that bush, yeah. She's busy chewing, but she hasn't had her head down in the grass for a while. And what she's busy doing is ruminating. So she's regurgitating the cud and re-chewing it. So we actually looped ahead of these buffaloes to try and get in front of them as they were moving through the grass and they've all kind of stopped here and they seem a bit reluctant to pass us. So that's why as they've settled down, there's some grunting happening. As they've started to settle down um, with us being around, they've started to ruminate, which is something that they subconsciously do. And they can even rest and, and get um, some proper, well, almost sleep. The same amount of rest that they would get sleeping uh, from or while they ruminate. See those big ears pointed in our direction and then she moves the one back every now and then. A pro is asking what is a buffalo's predator. So the biggest threat for a herd of buffaloes will be a pride of lions. That's, they're, they're almost like arch rivals. They have this war uh, between one another. Buffaloes will try to even kill lion cubs if they come across them um, just because they know that they're uh, potentially or they could potentially be a threat in the future so they'll try to, to take them out. But young buffaloes, um, there are, the leopards have been known to follow herds of buffaloes and look for young, young buffaloes and, and try and pick them off when the adults are not watching. But a buffalo herd has the strength in numbers and they're not afraid to defend uh, themselves or one of the fellow herd members from lions or other predators. So we're on our way up to the meerkats, but we just bumped this pale chanting goshawk on top of the sociable weaver nest. But what a setting that is. That massive old tree, huge nest, and then perched right on the top there is our nemesis, the pale chanting goshawk. Well, not the birds itself, but their nest. And we are slap bang in the middle of nesting season, and I've yet to find their nest. That is embarrassing. But I'll get it right. Maybe next year or the year after. On my birthday. But these birds are, are really interesting. You know, you got to think, oh, there's just two of them. Because the other one's actually further behind us. He's just out of sight now. But he, he just came flying over. But their, their peak laying dates are July, August, September. So we, like, we're in it. We, we right here now. So... You know, it's just literally a matter of finding the nest. And when we saw the other one further, further back, Moritz actually spotted it. And I was like, oh, geez, it's great if we're only seeing one bird, because that means the other one is almost certainly close by on a nest somewhere. Uh, we drive 100 meters down the road, here's a second one sitting out in the open, so that didn't work. But, um, yeah, I do need to find this nest. We'll get it. I was just reading up on them as well. Those nests are quite interesting. You know, like a lot of your birds, as we know, you know, they line the nest with feathers and soft, soft vegetation stuff. Sarah H has said, what a huge nest. Absolutely. That's a sociable weaver nest. It's the largest nest of any social breeding bird in the world. So, and that, that, that nest is a very average size nest. For swallow, you, we've got nests here that are four, five times that size. Literally, I mean, they they get immense, absolutely immense. So, the, the, I've seen goshawk nests 
on the top of these sociable weaver nests, but very, very, very infrequently. I don't think that's a typical nesting thing. They like making, making a little platform of, of branches. And then so I was reading up on it, it's quite interesting. They'll actually line the nest on the inside. They've used regurgitated lion pellets here. Lions, like any cats, they'll throw up like hair and that kind of stuff and puts a bone in that. So they've actually been recorded using lion pellets, lining the nest with ostrich dung sometimes. So it's like really odd, really weird. There's preening, so that feather maintenance is always important. It almost looks like he's ready to fly off somewhere. Sometimes they they poop just before they fly, so they cock the tail poop and then they fly off. So if you're ever bird watching or you're into photography and you want to get that like in-flight shot as it takes off, when a bird poops, you know it's about to take off. It's a fairly cool morning out here this morning. It's a lot cooler than it was yesterday. Yes, yesterday was like mild. It was a, but then we had all that cloud cover, which really helped in terms of trapping heat. But this morning, no, nope, it's a bit bit cooler. Like I said, at least oh look, that's nice. So when you see that, that kind of gives you a better idea of the scale of what you're looking at there. And the mountains are way out to the left hand side of the frame, about. There you go, there's the mountains there. I love those kind of like wide shots because it just really gives you a feel for the landscape that all these species that we're looking at are functioning in. Yeah, you know, whether it's a tree or that nest or that goshawk or whatever, you know, it really just gives you a good understanding, appreciation of the of the vastness of the area. Come goshawk, reveal to us where your nest is. Well, that's not going to happen. Like, in evolutionary terms, they've spent their entire life trying to hide their nest, and then Smith comes along and expects to find it. Good morning for a, from all well, from a very grey and gloomy day here at Prydens, but at least we've got some elephants and a couple of very chirpy birds as well. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and on camera with me today is Sebastian Romby, and we are all wrapped up trying to keep nice and warm as the cold weather is upon us. But hopefully, it'll be gone soon. I think by tomorrow the weather probably would have uh, warmed up a little bit nicer. But here we have just a. Uh, some male elephants all feeding. We actually had the breeding herd a couple of minutes ago, but they're moving into an area where we just can't get signal. So we thought that we would just hang out with the boys for a little bit. Here's one of the bigger bulls within the herd, just munching away. They seem to have pushed over an acacia of sorts and are now chomping on it. You can see some stuff falling out of his mouth. He's very carefully trying to snap little twigs. Ah, there's some leaves. Very tasty. These particular trees are very nutritious and often a firm favorite from any of the animals that do a bit of browsing. So they'll be very happy about that. You can see, look at that. It doesn't mind the thorns. Eh? It's amazing. But those thorns are actually very flexible. They're not particularly solid and, and quite hard. So if an elephant does wrap its trunk around, or a giraffe does the same thing with its tongue, uh, they are able to hold on tight and, and often just strip the leaves. That's what the giraffe will do, but the elephant doesn't mind eating some of those small twigs. They look nice and juicy, nice and supple, so it won't be too difficult for this elephant to chomp on those. Now, Sarchage, uh, the lifespan of an elephant can be anywhere from 50 years to about 70 years or so. But an elephant very rarely will die of old age. Normally what happens is it's quite a, quite a sad process, in fact, is that an elephant runs out of teeth. 
basically. They wear down to the point where they can't chew uh, their food very well or even at all. Um, so elephants have about six sets of molars that come through at different stages of their life when they start to wear down. If they have to replace them too quickly because they're not eating uh, nice soft vegetation, you can imagine if, they, if it was just winter, dry season all the time, their teeth would wear down a lot quicker having to grind down thorns and twigs and branches and bark and um, I'm sure a lot of this vegetation has a lot more sand on it too so that all wears the teeth down um, quite quickly. So it's a very very slow process so these elephants at this time of the year are also starting to feed along drainage lines and closer towards dams where the vegetation might still have some greenery to it or be a bit more lush uh, than some of the stuff growing away from water sources and you typically see that with older elephants too. There's a uh, as those teeth start to wear down, it becomes more and more difficult for an elephant to eat its daily calorie intake, which is quite sad. It's actually it's, it's very, very sad. But these young boys won't have that problem at all. Right. Now what we're going to go and do is you're all going to go and have a look and learn a little bit more about the family dynamics of elephants. Elephants have fascinated us for so long because they display the same social complexities and full emotional range of our own human species. Mothers, sisters, cousins and aunts live in herds while the bulls wander the wilderness as bachelors. Cows live in the same herd from birth until the end of their life some 60 years later. The herd is led by the oldest and wisest female, the matriarch. She's not only responsible for leading the herd, but also dishing out discipline to the often unruly teenagers. With their flappy ears, floppy trunks and folded skin, baby elephants have the cuteness edge over their human counterparts. Like toddlers, they are playful, curious, and love rolling about in the dirt. Human voices and vehicles provide endless entertainment for bored little elephants, and they, in turn, are always a source of amusement for us. Exploring is the main source of calf entertainment, but it's a scary and sometimes prickly world out there. And mum is thankfully never far off. Bulls become boisterous when they hit puberty, and this irritates the matriarch. Once she's had enough, she will boo them out of the herd to find their own way in the world. Like playground bullies, the young males fight for dominance, sometimes with extreme violence. The older bulls live alone but mentor these young bucks. It is these fellows that are the ultimate gentlemen of the wilderness. Looking at the elephant's social structure, to me, I have always thought it's very complex. When I look at all the animal species we got in the African wilderness, I think elephants, the way they relate to each other, it is very, very special. Now, it has remained where it was at much, and we have just been hoping we'll see more of them come out of the water, not as many yet. I think that was much courageous as a male to come up number one. Remember, we are coming to you live and how marvelous to be watching a digital safari courtesy of 
CGTN. Now, why I have stuck in this particular place is because I've been hoping we might be lucky to see some wildebeest coming to cross here. If not wildebeest, even zebras. Once in a while, like the elephants you're just watching in that clip there, we have seen them coming to drink the water. But the last three nights here in the Masi Mara, we have had rain every other day. And what that translates into, most of the grass is full of moisture. Uh, the small little branches or leaves that could be feeding on, they have lots of water in them and they may not come to drink as yet. But later in the day, in the heat of the day when it warms up, chances are they may come for a drink. Still so enjoying the flow, and the waterfalls of the Mara River. The hippos are still enjoying staying in the water. None of them has really come out. That has just disappeared and Two heads up there and where we have that big current earlier we had seen like a body of a wildebeest floating and I remember I had a question earlier whether when the current is so heavy it pushes the babies of cro crocodiles or hippos downstream now that to me is a wildebeest that could have died somewhere you see there and maybe during the crossing, because it was not here earlier when you got here, and I believe it was pushed by the current and it was stuck right there. So maybe some rocks are holding it there, or maybe there could be a croc just holding it there. We'll just wait and see what happens if it will be moved downstream. Okie dokie, we have another elephant bull who is much larger than the rest of the bulls that have been feeding. He really threw his weight around. He came marching through the bushes. He didn't dodge one of them. It's like he was trying to announce that he was coming on through. And he then pushed that other younger bull we were watching right out of the way and thought, right, I'll just carry on and finish up on this tree. Thank you very much. So you can see he's much older even just by looking at his face. He looks a lot more worn. And if you look just above his eyes and sort of where his temple is, you can see how sunken that part of his head is. And that's a, another good way to kind of age animals, or especially elephants, sorry, this is particular to elephants, um, is that the older they get, the normally sort of more sunken these cavities sort of become. So it's another thing that you can kind of use, because it can be quite tricky to age elephants. It takes a lot of experience, and even then we don't get it right. But we, you know, we just give a rough kind of estimation, looking at their overall size, looking at that part. You can look at the wear and tear on their tusks, which this bull only has one. Um, not very big tusks, though, but that doesn't really necessarily define his age. It's, unfortunately, we're seeing a decline in big tuskers, um, especially here in southern Africa. That's quite sad. Not our really big elephant bull, Kumo, that we see on a regular basis. He's much larger than this fella, but this guy is somewhere in between. And he's got an interesting tear in his ear too. So that's a way that I often use to identify elephants. Obviously, you've been watching leopards and lions, and we're able to identify individuals. We can do the same thing with almost any animal. But elephants, it's a lot easier. Um, because on their ears, with it being such thin skin, you often get interesting shapes. So that could have been a tear from when he was much younger. Maybe it hooked on a thorn. Maybe it was a bit rough with one of his siblings or cousins or whatever running around in the herd. And his ear got torn, but it heals quite quickly. Um, so you can look for that. Otherwise, they, again, their tusk shape and any, any other interesting features that you can find on an elephant. But I'll remember this bull from right here with the tear sort of in the middle of his ear. But he's lovely. Everyone is very calm and peaceful. Yesterday the elephants were trumpeting and rioting around, so I think that they are happy that the wind has died down, but now we just need it to warm up. I have a very calm and peaceful water buck here too, although he is giving me quite a stern look at the moment. But very, very peaceful. Sometimes I think that they look... They look like principles, 
or teachers. Hi everyone, it's me Trishala with Theo on camera this morning at Juba Game Reserve. I've just been smacked in the face by a branch, which is why my lip is a little bit... It looks like I have lipstick on. <laughs> Theo got slapped in the in the foot with a branch the other day, so you know, we are, we are matching. Swollen foot and swollen lip. Our water buck doesn't care too much about that. So he's busy going about his day, having something to eat. He's not too far from a water source. Water, box, uh, water bucks love to be around water. Generally between, say, a 5k radius and a 2k radius. Most of the time they try to be within 2k's of a water source. They're water loving. And he is on his own because the bulls are fiercely territorial. And those white markings on their face that I said to you, he looks like he's quite stern the way that he's looking at me. Those white markings are meant to emphasize that kind of serious face and posture that they take when they want to advertise themselves in their territories to cows and their offspring that come through. They'll try to secure a territory that includes a water source as well as good grazing. And as females come through, he'll try to keep them in his territory. Macy, that's a, that's, that's a really, really interesting thought. You'd like to know if they, if different antelope are territorial towards other antelope, not of the same species. Well, by definition, being territorial means that you are defending a patch of land and resources against your own species, and that is because you are looking, because you're the same species, you have the same requirements of the environment. So you want to secure certain parts of it just for yourself. Now within antelopes, you have grouses and bra and uh, grouses, browsers and grazers and mixed feeders, but they're all just a tiny bit different. Maybe they take long grass, maybe they take short grass. Maybe uh, they're only browsing today. Maybe they're mixed feeders like impala. So they generally will not defend their territory against other antelope because everyone is after the same type of resource, but just a little bit different. Whether it is height, maybe a giraffe is only going to, the, or can get to the tops of trees that other antelope can't get to. So it's looking it's looking at different, almost as if a niche is even more specified and sectioned out into more specific niches. Giraffe, the tops of trees, then a kudu, slightly taller than what an, uh, than what an impala can reach. So even though everyone's after vegetation, there's actually no need to exclude other antelopes from your territory. But that's an interesting question because you often don't think about, about that. And you see them together quite often. Whole lots of different antelope. I am going to head up towards the Buffles Hook Dam. That was the plan for the morning. Hopefully there'll be some elephants playing around. Welcome back to Ambion Pinda. We are still sitting with this herd of buffalo, there's lots going on. We've just found this one, looks like a young bull, and he's found a stump that he's busy rubbing on. He's got, his, he's got it between his legs now. And he's just shifting his body around it and making sure he scratches every little piece, or every little itchy bit. Oh, but I think he's done now. That'll be his mom. 
uh, just to the right of him. And he will stick with her for about four or five years, uh, clo quite close to her side. And after that, he'll move move out and become a, well, he'll join a bachelor group, usually made up of other young bulls like himself and some much older bulls. And he will try to learn from those older bulls. When he's big enough and strong enough, he might come back to the same herd or perhaps another herd and try to take on some of the dominant bulls in the herd and fight for mating rights. Look at that calf in the road there. It's quite a young one in the road at the moment, looking, walking straight towards that egret. And off she goes. So I've just been sitting and watching them uh, as they cross this road. And they seem to be moving up into uh, quite a thick area uh, with some good shade. The sun is starting to peek through. And uh, I think that these buffaloes are going to definitely be moving into a shady area because when it gets hotter today, they're going to lie down. JP, 100% buffaloes. So the question is, do buffaloes suffer from foot and mouth disease? And yes, they do. That is a bovine disease and it is transmitted from cattle to wild animals like buffaloes. And so game reserves like us, uh, we have to do our best to make sure that there is no interaction between buffaloes and cattle on the outside. So what a lot of places that we, like us, we, we've got a, an extra fence. So there's, a, there's our perimeter fence or perimeter fence. And then five meters from that perimeter fence, there's an, another sort of smaller fence. Uh, and that is to keep the cattle at a distance of about five meters from our fence at all times because they'll come and smell and urinate, defecate, and then potentially the, our buffaloes would go to, the, if for some reason they were along the fence line, they would go and investigate, uh, smell the dung and smell the urine of the, of the cows. Just inst instinctively they would do that, that's their, their behavior, and they would be able to pick up the disease like that. So it is something that we have to consider. Comes a little one onto the road again. Still lots of egrets following this herd and we hear the ox peckers every now and then looking for ticks on these buffaloes. Oh and we've got some joining us very close on our right hand side. Sorry about my head. So we're gonna, from here, these, most of the buffaloes have already crossed the road, they're heading up the hill into some shade. We're going to carry on and finish checking through this area if there's any sign of that cheetah. Well, we'll always get the young ones running to the mothers because it might secure there. And the same here, should we have calves of these hippos in any sort of danger, you'll always see them very quickly uh, running to the mothers. Now this hippo has come out very close to where we got the crocodile and not sure she's turning around and whether that's her back. And if you look carefully, uh, she got some injuries or her skin looks to be wounded. 
And once in a while we have seen hippos using the very long canine teeth fighting each other. And it is these small little wounds that they have will get ox pickers sometimes coming to land on them to try and get some blood from them. You see how she blends in there very well? And you can see the color of the water is much brown. If you were watching yesterday morning, it wasn't as this brown. And to me, this is an indication there were big rains upstream and definitely there's a bit of erosion as the water has been coming downstream. The rapids still continue and I usually wonder whether this affects the behavior of these animals here, either the crocs or the hippos when the rapids, sometimes I like calling waterfalls, get even bigger. The other day we were just sitting here and all of a sudden we had the rapids, the sound went up without, you know, knowing and wondered what happened and then we like, ah, it must have rained upstream and as the water came building up, of course, we expected that to happen, but it got, it caught us off guard. You can see how far now the water has come. When we got here, the water wasn't where it is now. It was about much inside by another one meter which would mean maybe the rains might have continued overnight and the water levels will keep going up and edging towards the riverbank. I wouldn't expect any antelopes to come and have a drink now because it's still a bit cold and I was just saying before they could be feeding on some grass that is quite uh, wet and full of moisture. Our croc hasn't moved from where it was. We've still got more hippos trying to show up their heads. And once they, they breathe, they have enough oxygen, they may go under for a couple of minutes before they show up again. He's warming up nicely now, and I'm looking at more hippos coming uh, out of the water. From talking about elephants, I've seen elephants now. Big herd of elephants near the river and what could be is early part of the morning elephants tend to feed uh, close to the river where there's a, tend to be a lot more greener trees um, the grass tends to be a bit more lusher because of the water around and uh, you can see this one right here in front of us how she's picking the grass and then flicking it against her chest or against her leg and then putting that into her mouth and what she's just basically trying to do is get rid of the sand because um, with that sand it wears down the teeth quite a bit Now, just right off to the side there, there's a young calf that's moving through the tall grass. Now, it's really hard to see, but we might just pick up some movement soon. So if you move like that, there we go. So you'll notice as soon as that youngster moves too far off, either you will turn around and head back to mom, or mom will slowly start to follow the youngster but there's quite a few birds here so from where that elephant was just left of it there's um right in the middle it's, it's gonna be hard to explain but i'm going to try and see if we can get this but right there right in the middle you'll see there's a bird with a lot of beautiful colors you'll notice there's a dash of white on the, around the the bill bit of blue on the side it was chased by this other bird called the virtual starling but what i want to describe so that was a lilac breasted roller and then this uh, bird that just chased it off that perch is a uh, virtual starting so why are they here is because as these elephants are moving disturbing the grass there's a few insects maybe grasshoppers or anything that will fly up and they'll go and catch it now on top of that there's another interesting bird up in the tree so where that but the bigger elephant is just on top of that there's a, a tree without any leaves and there's a few birds jumping around there now i want to see if we can find out exactly which ones those are but it sounded like a shrike of some sort just by the call Maybe, let me just see if I can get my binoculars on it. Are they, they refer to as Retz's helmet shrikes. 
So they are very nice birds to see for the area. Now, I just want to see if I can get another glimpse. If we don't get another glimpse, I'll try and see if I can get in the book. But they have moved further away. I just want to listen. There's some zebras that got a fright on this side. And all the elephants started running off. Now, remember early on we said there were tracks of lions coming into this area? Now, I wonder if it wasn't the lions that gave these elephants and the zebra fright. So the zebra running off to the right. Let's slowly move forward. Maybe that pride is somewhere here. Now that's the pride of 18 lions that are around. So the last tracks we, we had were coming down here. Now there's more elephants that side and the zebra just ran on our right. You can see some of the younger elephants also turned around and started running off. We'll keep a good lookout as we move through here. Linda, with the, so for some of you with the quiz on the elephant dung, um, so the, the actual reason why it has that orange color is because of the tannins. So that's the, the chemical that you find in the cambium there that eventually produces that very uh, orangey color. You also find it in wines as well. But well done for most of our viewers. Oh, all I heard was all our viewers. So there's a young elephant right in the middle of the road. There's actually a few off to the right as well. So, some fantastic work having been done by Veronique, our meerkat habituator. She's relocated this group and they are back at what we call the Boskia burrows. Remember Boskia, these big shepherd's trees. Um, the nest that we were looking at earlier with a goshawk perched on top there, that big sociable weaver nest, that tree with a lovely white stem, that's a shepherd's tree, or also known as a Boskia albitrunca. Um, and that's where these meerkats are back at the, the, this particular burrow system here. They're not out yet. Remember I mentioned earlier how cool it is this morning. It's not cold. It's not by any means a freezing cold morning. It is just considerably cooler than it was yesterday, which means they're more likely to get up a little bit later, but I think not too long. I think it's going to be the next minutes they're going to be up. Um, and again, we just do the routine scans around. There's nothing untoward that's been around these burrows all night. I'm still on the lookout for badgers, um, but nothing yet. A lot of brown hina tracks up and down. There's been a stack of giraffe activity in the area. A lot of mice, but uh, like I say, nothing that's going to impact on these little badgers for the moment. So all good, all good. I am so glad to see this. This is a tree wisteria, and you can see it's a beautiful purple flowers. And well and truly signifies the end of the dry season. That's when you see these clusters form. Just lovely. It's the first one that I've seen with flowers. All the others I've seen didn't have any flowers yet. So this is well and truly the end, at least indicated by uh, our tree wisteria or Balusanthus speciosus. These little clusters look like grapes almost. Beautiful lilac flowers. The whole bush will start to explode with flowers very soon. End of the year, you're gonna get all those lovely lion's eyes. You're going to get the African wattles with the yellow flowers. And hopefully more of the tree wisteria's flowers too. The knobthorns have flowers on them. Oh, it just feels like spring is upon us. But like I said, these ones do signify the end 
of the dry season when you get these great clusters of these mauve flowers forming. Now the leaves of the tree wisteria are very, very pretty as well. Quite shiny. And a really pretty green. And they are deciduous, so you can see that most of the leaves on this tree has fallen. There's some right at the top there. And then there's a younger specimen just off to the left that does have some leaves on it, slightly shorter guy. There we go. It also looks like it has a basketball hoop through it. That should be fun. Linma, you'd like to know which animals would feed on these on these flowers. Baboons and monkeys like them very much. Vervet monkeys and baboons. They especially like them. And as you can imagine, they won't last long when baboons and vervet monkeys like them. Vervet monkeys also especially like uh, leopard orchids. Another one that's flowering at the moment, that one at Chitwa. Just stunning. My favorite bit about this tree is the color of these flowers. You can see that it's quite windy. The shape of the leaves, and I said that I really like the leaves, the color is really bright yellow, but the shape of the, of the leaves remind me a lot of like a eucalyptus tree. And even the way that they, that they fall reminds me a lot of that. But the color is much yellowy green as opposed to the gray, blue, green that you see with eucalyptus trees. Awesome. Well, we're going to move on and find some other special things. Welcome back to and beyond Pinde, everyone. We found these, well, there's actually three side-striped jackals and if you look at those two in screen there's a lot of posturing going on they're completely puffed up and they're walking side by side trying to show their size we've yeah we've come across them while we've been looking for excuse me for this cheetah and it looks like there's some kind of I don't know if it's a territorial thing or a or a mating ritual because it looks like there's one female and one male. And then there's a third that's very submissive and it's lying off in off to the left in the grass. It looks like things are calming down now. There was a little bit of a tussle earlier. But everyone well, they all seem to be okay. They are quite a distance away, so it's been quite tough to see um, males and females because they are very similar in size. Uh, you'd have to see underneath the tail to tell male and female apart. But all we know is that there are these two that have been displaying against one another and then there's a third one that's lying in the grass. It's more submissive. And that one on the left has now got its mouth open and looks like it's making some noises but we are a bit too far away unfortunately to hear. See the, the one on the right tail up in the air and you can just see the tip. There we go, look at that tail right up.
Toto, that is correct. They, they're able to puff themselves up. We can hear a bit of growling now. They're able to puff themselves up, um, st put their hair on end, and in order to make themselves look bigger, so they've, they're puffing their, almost their entire body, including the tail, up, and then they, they're arching their backs, and then they're walking side, side by side, and then they, there is a lot of urinating and defecating going on. And that one in the front has got its tail standing up and all the fur standing up on the tail. So it is definitely, they are definitely trying to make themselves appear bigger by, by making their hair stand on end. That one that's uh, at the back now looks like it's a bit bigger than the one in the closer or closer to us. But I've never seen this before. I, I'm not 100% sure what is going on. It is a great find, Jane. I've, I'm very excited because I haven't actually seen this kind of behavior before. By now, uh, most of the nocturnal species like jackals have found a place to rest for the day. Uh, jackals more especially hard to see during the day because they go down into burrows. There's the third one. It's just trotting off to the right. But yes, while we were looking for the cheetah, I actually thought it might... Oh, and he's being mobbed by... Whoa! Being mobbed by lapwings. These are blacksmith lapwings that are now dive-bombing the jackals. He or she, should I say. I've, I haven't been able to tell which of them are males, which are females. But yeah, like I say, they, they should be down a burrow already and they're still out. So they've obviously got unsettled or unsolved business out here. It almost seems like they're driving this other one out. I'm running now. All three of them are off now. So that one that's that's in the front or the right of your screen is the one that's been submissive the whole time. They're about to run into some zebras. And I, what I have seen out here is that zebras are not fans of jackals and we've actually seen the zebras chasing the jackals. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> this is incredible, I've never seen this. Now they are going a little bit far away from us. So we'll try to keep an eye on them. And you see the zebras are all, well you can't see now, but the zebras are all watching them. Craig having a bit of a hard time because they've gone all the way almost past the back of the car to like behind us. See now the zebras are going a little bit closer. I wonder if the zebras are going to chase them. There we go, zebras running. Oh, there's a dip on that side that I think they've gone down into. I think we'll... Because there is another road there. I think what we're going to do is we're going to try and loop around and see if we can get another look at them because the zebra, the zebra, one of the zebras has definitely given chase. So yeah, we, we're going to do that now.
Wow, that is absolutely incredible. Grant must be having the time of his life. There's nothing better than seeing animals do something you've never seen before. Here we have two gorgeous giraffe. Oh, I thought they were just, they had decided to leave the scene as soon as you came to me. But it looks like they're just looking for another spot of greenery. Are oh, they up near the fire break? The northern fire break? Very nice, relaxed. And we're so lucky that we're seeing so many of them lately. Now on the fire break, the trees that are actually sprouting are much shorter than say you'd have in the drainage or in flatter parts of Juma. And I love watching them bend over to actually feed. Some biologists have, biologists have theorized that Males feel feed at the tops of trees while females feed towards the bottom of trees. But it is, in my opinion, not something I've seen. I've seen both male and female. We have two males here. I've seen both of them bend down to feed, stretch up to feed etc. The most reliant way, or reliable way, to, to figure out the sex of an animal is to look, simply look at its undercarriage. Yes, I'm so sorry to do that to you, giraffe, but that is the most reliable way to figure out if you're male or female. Now, giraffes, they also have ossicones, those are two horn-like things at the tops of their heads. And you can see that they are rounded. And that comes from males actually fighting with each other, rubbing against posts and things like that, that bald those ossicones. And look at those eyelashes. Beautiful, tall animals. And when they walk, it's really, really special going across the African landscape. Hello, and welcome back to the Mara. And here I found a lioness desperately looking for something in all directions. She doesn't look very hungry, but she is definitely looking for something. From where she is, it is a bit, you know, you know hard to tell which pride she is from. Behind her is the Salt Lake Pride area. A long ways back there and off to the right of the screen is the SSP, Sausage Tree Pride area, and behind me is the Mugoro Pride area. So I don't know which pride she is from, but she is definitely a beautiful lioness. Very, very, you know, strong, see her? Very, very big, mature, so, so she is definitely part of a pride from where she is. She's got a very good vantage point to, you know, pinpoint or see anything moving. But far and wide, there is nothing. But with her keen sense of sight, I'm sure she will be spotting something. Yes, beautiful yon. Look at, you know, those canines sharp, ready to pierce through skin. Usually that is a good sign of being restless. So we might see a movement, you know, in a while. You know, like I said, the beautiful eyesight is what she is using, you know, the keen sense of, you know, sense of, you know, sight. Yeah. 
you know, this is uh, all live from the Masai Mara, the Mara Triangle. You can talk to us on hashtag CGTN Wild, hashtag Wild Earth. That's where you can communicate to us, tell us, you know, something. Questions are very welcome. I'm staying with her for a little bit long, longer, so don't go far. Juma. We have been very blessed to have a up close and personal interaction with this herd of elephants. Unfortunately they are now all going behind the car. That was very special. They all walked right next to us and stopped right in front of us as the the big mama checked us out, spoke to the whole herd, and then they all moved across the road. Very blessed to be in situations like that. With his live as Isaac says, and now they've gone into the bushes, so we're gonna try to relocate to see if we can get you another position by going around that way. Let's see if we can get you these elephants again. Just around the corner. Sorry about that, everybody. We're about to catch up with our herd again. And they're pretty relaxed, so we might be able to just position ourselves in a way that they come towards us. So that is what you want to do. If you know a herd is relaxed, you can position yourself in a way that they'll move towards you. If they come closer, that's okay. That is the way it works. Early move here. Oh. Now behind there you might see a little bit of a structure. That is where we get our water from. That comes from the ground. And here come the elephants. I'm just going to be quiet and allow you to just enjoy this wonderful scene. Way that they're moving it seems as if they're on their way to drink so I think we'll follow them elephants drinking can often be quite spectacular to see it's just they make lots of noise they splash they really just are quite busy animals there is a bull who's sort of hanging with the herd but not really in the middle he's always on the outskirts maybe we'll be with the herd at a watering hole. Welcome back to the Mara and I'm with my 
unknown lioness in the, in the middle of the plains. There's no tree you know, near us, only a sea of grass surrounding us. And in between me and her is about 30 meters. She's there sleepy, but every now and then she's staying up and looking around. I'm hoping she's gonna spot something and decide to make breakfast. Remember, lions don't need to eat every day, but if up on opportunity prevails itself, it is a cat that is known to feed every day, gorge itself with as much meat as possible, build up extra fat, so in lean times, it can go for up to 14 days without eating. She is a very, very mature female. I would give her a good, you know, six years. She's got no worry in the world and looks very healthy. And the alertness tells me that either she hasn't eaten in about three days, four days. The reason she's all here by herself, I don't know. If she's going to, you know, you know, stands up, I will be able to tell. Maybe she's around here, maybe because she's got some cubs that she's hiding somewhere, and that's why she's separated from everybody else. It is typical for the first 14 to around a month of birth for a female to exclude herself so that the young ones can get a real imprint and they can get that motherly love and first love that they need you know, to grow up. Remember, they are fully blind at birth, you know, opening their eyes after around two weeks. And after that, you know, they will stay in one area, being moved every about week, so that the scent doesn't go too strong to attract, you know, predators that might kill them. At the moment, I'm not saying that she's got any it's all about a matter of seeing if she's got tits that are being used or mammary glands that are being used. Like I said, you can tell she's up. No, no, no cubs at all. She's just a very healthy lioness in the middle of nowhere. She's got no cubs. Her mammary glands haven't been used, but she's a fully grown adult lioness no much signs to tell who she is. She's got that one notch on her right ear, facing away, right here, she's got a deep notch and no other markings. And also another left, you know, a notch on the left ear. From where she is, she's looking away and hopefully she'll catch a tail of a warthog walking through long grass, and that's where the hunt is gonna begin. Remember, lions don't need to waste their energy walking you no know, distances, looking for wherever they will go for. She can stay where she is, and with her keen sense of sight, she can stop, you know, she can spot something even 500 meters away, and can choose either to go for it, or wait for it if it's coming in their way. So they utilize the energy, you know, by using the sight. I'm gonna move around, see if you can see her face. Excuse me. Excuse me. And, you know, once more, look at her, and then maybe move on if she's not doing much. And uh, yeah, we'll maybe find something else. Um, yeah, I'm gonna stop here for Big James to do his magic with his camera. And remember to our elephants, everybody here in Juma. This young male is following the herd. Let's see how that female reacts to him when he gets a bit closer. His trunk is smelling the ground. If he gets closer to her, she might behave in a certain way, or maybe he knows just to keep his distance.
start squawking there if a lilac could break the roller. Jace, you want to know how elephants grow so large, considering the limited diet? Well, the largest, largest mammals on land in the world are all vegetarian. So there's plenty of vegetables around, plenty of vegetation, grass, plenty of trees and leaves. If anything, elephants are the most selective, being a bulk feeder. They're able to access everything from the shoots of the, the tallest tree to the bark, to the leaves of all the trees and grasses and flowers and fruits and even the roots of the trees as well. So they're very well adapted. Let's just move up a bit so we can get the rest of the herd. Buffalo, rhino, hippo, gorillas, all the biggest animals. They're all exclusively vegetarian. So plenty of vegetables around. There's an abundance of vegetation. There's more vegetation around than there's meat. So we mustn't get confused and think that meat is what makes animals big. There goes our little family following each other. Little sniff of the... That's a knobthorn acacia that's had its bark ripped a while ago. These two youngsters are probably going, hmm, I like acacias. One day when I'm big, I'll be able to stick my tusk into that bark and rip it myself. Just heard a golden tailed woodpecker there. Whee! There goes a mama with a bit of takeaway food. See, she's got a stick in her mouth that she's going to rotate in the mouth, eating the bark, and then she will drop, leaving the leaves altogether process known as corkscrewing. Okay, so they're feeding quite quickly and moving south. So it's almost as if they've decided, okay, we are thirsty, but we also snacky a little bit. So they're going to munch a little bit as they move down and uh, direction they're going is towards twin dams where we were before. It's possible they might be going to Chelapan, which is a pan that last I saw pretty dry now. So it's possible. And it's only taken a couple days for it to dry up. One herd of elephants or one buffalo herd moving through and these seasonal pans can be completely annihilated. Being quite late in the season to have some of the pans that we still have with a bit of water it was quite a good going to be honest so they might think chelapan has got some water anyway bypassing chelapan straight on towards twin dams it's possibly the route they're taking so we'll keep up with them when you know an area well when it comes to tracking an animal um, obviously we know we can see where they're going but if we find their tracks and they're moving quite quickly. Elephants that are moving slowly are meandering. Lots of feeding, lots of zang, left and right, zigzagging. Elephants that are on the move to drink move quickly along pathways. And you can almost anticipate where you will find them next. So that is what we're going to do. We're going to carry on down this road and see if we can catch up with them at their favorite watering hole. Welcome back. I'm still here with the beautiful lioness. Very relaxed. Look at the coat with that angle and the sunlight on her coat. It looks very shiny, so it tells you she's doing very well. She's having a lazy morning. I don't know what she's been up to at night. Maybe she's been hunting, trying the whole night and she couldn't make it so now it's the time to try and get something but every now and then she has to catch naps uh, to keep her you know rejuvenated and getting back into hunting mode uh, when she's well rested 
from where she is, I don't know what she sees, but I'm sure she can see, you know, see a very long, long, long way. And here, what I would think she would go for would be warthogs. When everybody is gone, the warthogs really get a hammering. They're also not easy to catch because they have very good eyesight. If, of course, if they are looking in the right direction, are also very keen sense of smell. And apart from that, it's not always that lionesses are successful to catch them because they are very, very aggressive and with their tusks that are always sharpening one another, they can really cause serious harm, even death to cats like this. So they are not also a walk in the park. The lionesses have to be really, really careful. But considering her size and age, I would say she's very, very experienced. Felicity, thank you for your question. You ask it, if it could be dangerous for her if she crosses into another pride's territory. Of course, and that could be fatal for her. And maybe that's why she's very alert. They are very careful to crisscross one another's territory, but territories are always to be fought you know, about every day. They do know their boundaries. They do know, you know, where, you know, their limits, where to reach. And maybe she is in her territory. I would say, uh, you know, she is very lost because I don't know wh which pride she is from. She could be in her territory, and if she is not, which sometimes it happens, um, when prides become too big, you find lionesses sometimes split to try and find, you know, territories that are not occupied. Uh, with a male, uh, or they can be invited to, you know, prides that have got fewer females, which is also not easy because she has to face a lot of you know, clawing, a lot of biting, and discrimination before she is welcome. So it does happen that they split from new to you know prides, but right now we cannot conclude on anything because. She's in the middle of nowhere, and we don't know if she belongs to a terrible pride or not. So she's definitely in a risk if she's not from a pride or from this area. Finally, they are out of bed. Can you believe it? Um, and Moritz, David and I were just chatting also with Veronique, who's saying, yeah, well, it's quite difficult to determine exactly what drives like a wake up time in, a, in any animal. You know, you can say, well, yeah, it's the sun rose and they had to get out of bed kind of thing. Or it could just be that maybe they had like a really good foraging day yesterday, um, which means they didn't have any huge rush to get out. Um, very, very typically though, if the times are tough and they're battling for food, they'll normally get up quite quickly and they head out. They don't spend too much time on burrow maintenance and sunning themselves, that kind of stuff. So when I'm seeing a group like this, yeah, with these two pups, the five adults, um, and they're actually getting up later, they're spending quite a bit of time at the burrows, it probably tells you though, that although we are actually past the heart of winter now we're going to slowly start moving to summer but really we're going into a harsh 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 time now as temperatures are picking up um, they're actually getting plenty of food to sustain them so i don't think there's any issues with this little group veronique was saying something interesting though is that one of the other burrow systems that they're going to frequently they're not actually using it at the moment but it's right in the periphery of the area and, and adjacent to the next colony of meerkats or group of meerkats and um that group is eight individuals, so there could be a big boxing match at some point. So we'll just keep our eyes on these little guys and just see what happens over the coming weeks. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that they've stabilized to this point now where we've got the two pups. What is really cool in this group, really, really cool, and we're going to be keeping for this, is that the beta female, in other words, one of the subordinate females here, seems to be heavily pregnant.
Ha! Which means we're going to be having even more meerkat pups. And that, the, 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 one of the things I just wanted to point out to you is we often see these groups as dominated by a single female, and that gets expounded on regularly. People are like, oh, you know, meerkats are, it's one female that breeds in the group. It's not true at all. Um, and very often it's just like time in the bush, observation, and whatever literature you go through, when you're talking to people, if your guide says something, don't be shy about questioning it. Lions sleep for 18 hours a day. Lions don't sleep for 18 hours a day, okay? They might be resting, sleeping on and off. Lions do not sleep for 18 hours a day. So don't be shy of questioning. If I say these meerkats are green, ask me, are you sure they're green? <laughs> Taylor May has asked a great question there. And do meerkats regulate their own temperature? Absolutely. So that we call endotherms. You get endotherms um, and ectotherms. So an ectotherm would be something like a monitor lizard. Remember that old Mr. Monitor lizard that we saw sneaking out of the tree a little while back? So he's heavily dependent. Well, not even heavily. He is totally dependent on external temperatures. So he needs to be able to get enough heat to be able to warm his body up from from the, the sun as a source, you know, or your ambient temperature being high enough for him to start moving and becoming active. And that's also crucial because if you got an ectotherm like that, that that eats a big meal and then you go into these super cold temperatures, that can present problems in terms of digestion and that kind of stuff. Um, but be that as well. So these little guys are what are called endotherms. In other words, they're producing their own body heat. <clears throat> that comes at a cost as well. Because you're producing your own body heat, it means you need lots and lots of energy right through the year in order to be able to do that in these environments. If you get an exceptionally extreme environment, and I'm talking about like the deep Arctic, you know, where you get animals that actually hibernate, the reason they hibernate in places like that is, number one, there's not an abundance of food. And if you don't have an abundance of food, you can't actually get enough energy to sustain daily activity patterns. So what do you do? Okay, all right, well, let me just hibernate. Okay, you get an opposite extreme to that as well called estivation, A-E-S-T-I-V-A-T-I-O-V-A-T-I-O-V-A-T-I-O-V-A-T-I-O-V-A-T-I-O-V-A-T-I-O-V-A-T-I-O-V-A-T-I-O-V-A-T-I-O-
I'm just about to say well done, hip toppy. Well done, excellent, very well done. Two crocs almost came for her, but she has made it. Excellent. How courageous for you to cross that dangerous river. I think as soon as she got to the edge, she made a decision very quickly and it was like, time to go. <clears throat> Katie, very true. That one is a very brave topi. I haven't seen many others doing that, especially knowing that she was single, not with the rest of the herd. And not only that, there were no other species of other animals, like, you know, wildebeest around, or zebras around, or hartebeest. But she made a decision on her own. You know what? I need to get on that other side. I don't see anybody who can identify myself with. I need to go. I know the dangers in this water and there could be crocs in it or some lions on the other end laying ambush. I'm going, I'm doing it, and she just did it. That was quite exciting. For me, I would want to say it could be the very first time I've seen a single animal and more so a topi crossing the Mara River on her own. That was an exciting moment. And this is what uh, CGTN uh, Digital Safari is all about. Here, a lot of uh, patience and waiting is very, very important. If you come to the bush, you always learn. Choose a spot if you want, stay there and wait and it will unravel or unfold every few minutes. Something will be happening that will be different. The rapids continue on the Mara River. Nothing has changed. It hasn't gotten any warmer, so that's why out the crocs haven't come out. And that was an exciting moment. Apparently, the Masimara and uh, Juma have, let me say, very different habitats. The Mara has more open areas, uh, huge grasslands that we call the savanna. The Juma has lots of thickets, and we're going to learn more about the same. The Masai Mara lies in the Great Rift Valley. It is home to a multitude of animals. The landscapes range from riverine forests to vast plains to volcanic hills. Running through the landscape, a watery lifeline. Rain is a necessity and plays an important role in this ecosystem. It nourishes the grasses, floods the marshes, and feeds the great Mara River. The river flows for about 395 kilometers, originating in the Kenyan Highlands from the Mao Escarpment. Streaming down and eventually draining into Lake Victoria in Tanzania. Water is life. This river is a core artery of the Mara. It is a safe haven for hippos and birds. But it provides the ultimate challenge for the wildebeest during the Great Migration. This annual event 
is one of the natural world's most astonishing spectacles. Nature favors strength. Their migratory routes are determined by the rain patterns as they wander in constant pursuit of water and fresh grass. To the Mara, and here I am in the open plains of Eloi Plains of the Mara Triangle. What you see here is very typical of the landscape that is surrounding me, surrounding me everywhere. Open grasslands as far as you can see. Just to remind you, grass is the most abundant plant in the world. There is just tons and tons of grass as far as you can see. Beautiful skies all over. Very single tree, typical of the Masai Mara. As far as you can see is just grass and grass. So this is what is called open savanna. We have other habitats called the wooded savanna and typical the name comes from when it is mixed up with you know little shrubs here and there and trees and then we have the escarpment which is also a habitat in the Mara. We have the riverine forest, all the forest you know along the river and you know the rocky outcrops. I will just do a 360 for you so that you see you know um, the you know how it looks you know really slowly just if we scan across there you will see it's just grass and grass and grass everywhere as far as you can see maybe if I stop here for a minute and you know, just to share with you the landscape further down there just a few Beautiful balanite trees. Look how cute those are. And what is absolutely incredible is just the speed that these little ones are growing at. And if you think, if you go back three weeks ago, just completely, completely, completely different animals. And um, it just shows the the amount of energy, you know, coming back to that question last time, you know, in terms of being an, an endotherm and, you know, generating your own body heat and that kind of stuff for, for activity. The amount of food that you've got to go through and just think at this growing stage, and all of us know it. You get a puppy and a puppy's cute and like, you know, six months later it's like almost an adult already. So we're kind of like aware of it and your know, parents always say, oh, my kids are growing so fast. But just think of that amount of energy that's going into doing that. And, um, you know, if, if you look at the two evolutionary um, parallels, you know, if you've got, if you got a, an ectotherm that uh, relies on your ambient temperature for survival and that kind of stuff, you know, there's also benefits to that because it means you don't have to be running around morning, noon and night trying to, trying to get energy. But it also comes at a price. You know, these little guys, you know, with the rise of the mammals, you know, there's just a whole lot of advantages there. So if you are able to run out and catch your prey or eat a plant, as long as you're able to do that, it'll enable you to persist in environments where other things actually just can't live. So I'm really curious, and you can see this one standing on the right, just in the right hand side of the frame, that big one standing, staring at David, like, David, what are you not telling us about these meerkats? Is there something you know that we don't? Because that one is really looking at you like, with longing, David. But anyway, that, that meerkat is, seems to be heavily pregnant. Um, you know, and I, you know, I can jump up and I can get excited. I'll only get excited when I see pups. Because I also, I also have this kind of like thing of, you know, if you name something, something's going to happen to it, a.k.a. Shelby's. But those Shelby ducklings are growing at a phenomenal rate as well. They are probably five times, six times the size of they were that they were when we first saw them. So, yeah, things are happening out here.
It is indeed. And how exciting. I remember how excited Dylan was last time with the, the pups. But we've managed to catch up with our herd, who has slowed down quite substantially here in, here in Juma. And this youngish female gave us a little bit of a... <laughs> bit of a funny look before and then I spoke to her gently and then she started feeding. It's a typical sort of behavior of an elephant that's been caught doing something they shouldn't be doing. She kind of did a little small jog towards us. Thought I'd be scared but I wasn't and then she felt a bit embarrassed that we weren't scared. Now she's decided to stop and have a little bit of something to eat. So we position ourselves in a quite a nice spot, I think, that we will be surrounded by this herd shortly. The same herd we've been with for a little while, but trying to anticipate their movements. Mm, that looks tasty. So you see how with her trunk, she's really, really going through the base of that bush there, looking for the best and juiciest. Now I should be determining that by smell. Um, the eyesight of elephants is okay, but you, know, you can't, they can't really see where they're putting their trunk, it's really in there. So they definitely can smell exactly what it is that they want. Yeah, here she comes. Is she gonna come and give us a little bit of a... Are you pregnant, my darling? I think she might be. Oh, she's thinking. When an elephant lifts its leg like that, everybody, you must always be allowed to make a decision. Oh, hello. Hello. <laughs> you are beautiful. Hello, gorgeous. How incredible is that? do look far bigger, don't they, when they get right up close like that, even a youngster like this. That was them talking. Who knows what that said exactly. Could have been very kind words. It could have been very nasty words. We don't really know. There's the, quick, there's the matriarch, though. She's the one you've always got to be aware of. Here comes another female BK. She's going to come get involved now as well. She's wondered what all the hype is about. She's going to come find out. Oh no, she's just going to come and eat. Okay, so here comes the one who's in charge. So her behavior is going to be very important to understand. She's the biggest. Lottie, no, I haven't actually seen that herd with the buffalo. BK, you saw it yesterday. It was around Treehouse. Okay, I haven't seen it, and we haven't seen it this morning. Yeah, the, the big mama just came and got involved and made sure that all of the all of the family was being good and not stepping out of line. Just coming and saying, no, this is just Steve and BK. They just had to film us and show the world what beautiful animals we are. And her communication would have everybody feel very relaxed. This little youngster being between us and mum, it's a very good indication that the herd is relaxed. The fact that they're feeding, going about their normal behavior is a very, very good sign. If you don't see the babies, that's the first indication that they're not 100%. <laughs> He's trying to put it in his mouth. Do you see that? The trunk is working, but it's, it's not very efficient at the moment. Come on, show us how you do that again, little one. Another mouthful of grass. <laughs> yes, I know mum uses her trunk to smash the grass around and knock off all the dirt. I'm trying to do it. I just don't quite have the technique down yet. 
That was special. Using its foot to help to push the grass out. Oh, I got stuck. <laughs> In the mouth. Yes, Mama, you are a magnificent family of elephants and uh, we're going to stay right with them. All morning we were successful in finding those lines we were looking out for. Um, and it looks like they might be on a kill. It's hard exactly it might be, but we're going to try and stick for a while and see um, if eventually we can get some glimpse of what it could possibly be. So I would like to encourage all our viewers, please send in those questions to um, hashtag wild earth, hashtag CGTN wild or at FC. We would love to hear from our viewers. So have a look at this young white male that's also just moving in the back. He's probably just seeing if there's any scraps that are left uh, from that carcass. He's really starting to turn into quite a beautiful male because of that mane that's starting to develop. Now there's quite a few things happening here. So we have the lines here on a carcass. Just next to it we have one of those big dominant Ross males that are lying down on their back with their legs up in the air. And we have a hooded vulture just up here in the tree from where these lions are. Just waiting for possibly these lions to move off to get some scraps as well. Okay, so up for me, I personally think that the, small, the, the strongest scent will probably be smell because lions, way before they even see an animal, they'll be able to pick up the scent, uh, especially depending on how hard the wind will blow. But what's interesting about them is, in some areas, uh, you might find that lions could climb onto trees, and then, of course, sight will be the stronger one. Uh, but in areas that are quite dense, uh, smell is the key in order to find uh, some of the animals, or even to find water. So they rely heavily on that. It's probably going to be their strongest scent. So if you look at that young male now, so the other one has just left and he's picked up something. Now, I'm not too sure what it is. I'm trying to see. Maybe all of you can have a look as well and see what it possibly can be. Kathy, with the lion's strongest uh, sense will probably be smell. Um, I think earlier I mentioned it, but I don't know if the signal might have been, uh, might have broken up there, especially because we are in the African bush. But so uh, smell is quite a big thing for them. Sometimes with these lions, you'll, they'll be able to uh, smell something way before they even see it. Now this area here, you can notice how dense it is in comparison uh, to those vast open areas that sometimes uh, we do drive through and so because of that the lines will heavily rely on smell and so they tend to move into the wind so the wind will blow towards them and if they do pick up a smell they'll use the cover in order to get closer so um, until they can eventually like spot the prey but there's eyesight the hearing everything is exceptional but their smelling uh, probably going to be the strongest or the best sense see this Young male has also picked up something and has just moved to the back now. Through in the back there, so where this one is, just slightly left at the back, through the trees. You'll notice there's that young male at the back. I'm just going to move slightly forward, so bear with me as I do this, because there's a young male and it looks like the other dominant male is heading towards him. But Jason, I agree with you, these lions blend in super well to this environment, so... I'm just going to move to here, just to see if we can get him. So we'll try and see if we can angle the camera. Now the other male is just moving behind him now, but you can see how wary he is, because yesterday already the male started fighting with him. And uh, of course he just doesn't want to leave the pride at the moment. He should have already left, but he's trying to hang in as long as he can, um, because he knows there's safety in numbers, but also... Uh, with the females hunting quite constantly, 
will be assured of some food. There's the other Ross now. Closer to us, they've just gotten up now. And you can see he's looking back. So it'll be interesting to see what interaction we're going to get here. Is this male just going to go and flop down, or is we going to move closer towards where that sub adult is lying down. I am now in the Mawati doing a bit of a river cruise, especially since now I realize that I don't need to touch the steering wheel or the pedals. Please want you to let Dylan know that I'm pulling one of his styles today. Now the reason I'm here is because I'm determined to find the python before I have to leave you guys. Still a week left, but I'm determined, absolutely determined. Now it's cold today, or colder than it has been, so the python will be wrapped up, trying to keep warm. It's been up in trees the last few times. It wouldn't be active very much at all. It wouldn't even be eating because reptiles need, need to actually have heat to increase the rate of their metabolism to begin to eat and to digest. So what can actually happen is that if they eat at the wrong time when it's very cold, basically their whole metabolism shuts down and they stop digesting and basically they get stuck and this can actually kill them. So it would be relaxing somewhere in a tree in a tight little ball or big ball and I'm going to find it. Thanks, Trish. Well, good luck finding your snake in the treetops. Um, we've come down into the river itself, and the big female elephant of this herd has pushed over one of the acacias, one of the river thorns. And I spoke earlier about how the elephants move in response to the youngsters. And what this female has done is she's facilitated the youngster's ability to feed on this tree. Now, just on the left of the screen there, you'll see those thorns that are sticking out by her body, those white thorns. Now, that is a different tree, but the same species. Now, she is pushed over the tree with thorns like that. Those really long, spiky thorns, which look quite uncomfortable, are no match for the elephant's mouth. And they will just stick the entire branch in their mouth. She's pushed over the tree, and now all the youngsters are able to feed on it as well. So that is a facilitation for her babies, for the youngsters. And then other animals such as um, Dekka, Bushbuck, Nyala, and Parla will also be able to come along to this tree that's been pushed over and feed on it as well. And uh, the way it's been pushed over, we didn't hear it crack or snap. I think she's just pushed it and it's moved a bit. And I think it's still rooted in the ground. So there's a very good chance the tree is still alive and will continue to grow with just a bit of a change in its direction. It's a very juicy new leaves on the acacia now. You can you see how green they are just above that elephant's head. Very little white or sort of yellow pom-pom blossoms. Very luminous green leaves. Now she's moving through that with her skin. Now if we try to walk through that, Okay. Now, sometimes we don't understand why they scream like that. It can always make you jump a bit. Sometimes it's a youngster trying to suckle. Sometimes it's a male elephant who's trying to join in the fray and trying to cause trouble with regards to mating. And sometimes they do that when they see predators. But you can see the behavior of the rest of the herd has not changed. 
But look at those thorns. Look how she's just going to stick it in her mouth. No problem. Very, very powerful thorns. The thorns have evolved to slow down the feeding rate at which antelope are able to feed. So the antelope will still feed on those plants, but they nibble around the thorns, which slows down their ability to eat it. But elephants, well, they just put the whole branch in the mouth. They're not bothered by the thorn at all. Their hide is so thick, the thorns can't penetrate either. And so they can just push themselves through these trees without any effort. And well, we'll stay here and watch this herd enjoy their breakfast. Well, there was a dash for cover for some reason there. And you've seen how relaxed they are with us. I'm, David is still seven, eight yards away from them. I'm that same distance behind David now. But remember, we've touched on this previously is this key point when they're leaving the burrows. And this little group is on the verge of going foraging now. Literally, it's like probably minutes away from foraging. Um, and they will obviously be super, super, super nervous. Anything that flits over, anything that draws their attention, and that's why they'll dash back. They will get to the point, however, where they cannot get back to their main burrow, and it'll be faster and more expedient just to get to one of their, what we call a bolt hole. And
right in front of him. You can hear the movement. Now, just behind me as we speak, there's that young male coming in. So have a look when he joins up with the rest of the pride. looks very, very really comfortable. Look at the young brother now, how he's just put his left paw on top of his sister. Now, his sister, also the other female that's there, looks like it's, it's hugging its sister. So see the leg goes over the head, and then look at the young male, how he's put his paw on top of his sister as well. Absolutely adorable to watch. And just listen to how peaceful it is if you listen now to the wind. You can almost hear these lines breathing. We didn't manage to find the woodpecker, but we did find this little bee eater. There's quite a few of them around. I love watching them. They're very reliable birds. If you want to take a good picture of a bird, they're a great one to watch because they tend to return to the same perch after they've flown about to hunt for bees and wasps and other flying insects. Aren't those colors just marvelous? Love the blue eyeshadow. is the world's smallest bee-eater. Yes, you. It's only about 15 grams. Oh, you are lucky enough to see one actually eating a bee a few drives back. You see how they rub the bee onto their nearest branch, or whatever they're perched on, to get the sting off and then gobble it up. Since this one is actively hunting, maybe we'll see it again. Their muscles must rework so fast. Fast twitch fibers must be on fire. Look at the head, almost jerky, because they move so quickly. Oh, almost lost its balance. Always oh, returning. They remind me of a green mango. Not quite ripe yet, starting to ripen. There's that bearded woodpecker calling again. The 
the Malwati is just great for birds. That's why I like to hang around you. Yeah? Ooh, that looks like a good one. Did you get anything? Not yet. Long, thin beak. That's just perfect to use as pincers to grab those aerial insects in flight. Welcome back. We are just down the road from Trishala and we've got ourselves a Birchall's starling. Now the Birchall's starling is easily identified from the other starlings in the area. You see it's got a black eye and it's got a little bit of a long tail. So quite glossy, the blue, very glossy. They're part of the glossy starlings. The other two we get is the Cape Glossy and the Greater Blue Eared that we get here. And both of them have got a very bright orange eye. So not to be confused. Okay, now this one is looking for insects that the elephants are disturbing. Elephants moving through the undergrowth. Yeah, we spoke about facilitation before by the uh, the elephant busy um, pushing over the tree and facilitating the feeding for the other elephants and other animals. Now right where the starling is looking is where those young elephants were kicking the soil and pulling up the grass by the roots. And by disturbing the soil, what you're doing is you're turning the soil over and you are providing or revealing insects that the elephant wasn't after, but a bird like this most certainly is. So another form of facilitation that this bird is managing to benefit from. At the same time, when the elephant's moving through the vegetation, they also disturb insects which they are then able to catch because many of the insects are extremely camouflaged. So many of you are commenting on how beautiful the coloration is. Yes, indeed. There are carotenoids in the feathers that are added at a reflection. When the light is in the right angle, they reflect back this beautiful blue. That is the elephant's tail you see swinging above. Um, and when they're in the wrong angle, the light, if it's coming from the wrong angle, it, they look completely black in color. So no doubt the glossiness helps them in retaining, or should I say avoiding, getting too hot. They are an, a bird that's very busy here in the summer months, throughout the year actually. They're always out and about. And one of the biggest issues animals have in these areas is trying to not get too warm. nice energy efficient way of getting food. Is it gone? Anyway, it's on the floor again. Here we go. This is either him or a friend that just arrived. See, look at all that. All the insects that have been turned over by the soil. So there's a bit of disturbance there. When, um, oh, what is that? I didn't know what it is. When the roots of the grass are pulled out. You've probably tried that at home before. You take some grass and you pull it out. Huge amounts of soil gets moved with it. And there can be many, many, many organisms that are then pulled onto the surface. And this bird is maximizing on that. Welcome to the Mara River. I am here, all packed and ready to give you updates on exactly what's happening here up the river. I have the residents, as usual, crocodiles, and maybe hippos are hiding underwater. I can't see them at the moment, but they are somewhere there. The river is even much faster today more browner yeah the hippos are hiding somewhere i can't see them and the rapids are even you know rough and tough today yeah remember this is the main source of livelihood for most animals that exist in the masai mara from the elephants the hippos the buffaloes the lions everybody the top is the giraffes depend on this river in the very dry time when I talk about dry, remember we have two seasons in the Mara. 
unlike other places where they have autumn, spring, summer and winter. Here we have only dry and wet. Our dry season starts now all the way to the middle of November. Then we have short rains all the way to February and the rest uh, from February to March, end of March is uh, also another long dry spell. Even from April to June, July, it's another uh, very long wet season. Right now we're at the beginning of dry and that's when all animals come here. Those are two massive Nile crocodiles. And they are inhabitants and they uh, super predators of these water, waters. Remember this, you know, prehistoric reptilian um, reptiles have, you know, been roaming in these waters and rivers of Africa for over 60 million years. It's one of the only few predators that considers man as a source of food. So here we don't swim and we are also very careful about Plight, you say what types of crocodiles we get in Kenya? The one and only one, the Nile crocodile, is the one we get in Africa, you know, in Kenya and in East Africa. These two are fully grown. I would estimate looking at them, they must be over 50 years. They do grow much darker as the age. Their heads become very stout. And those two are males, looking at the, um, the head. Usually females are much more pointed and less, you know, they're much more colorful. You know, you see spots of yellow and dark spots. These ones are males, I would say. A good, the one farthest, the one we can see all the way to the tail, I would give him a good maybe 19 feet easy. He's very long and could weigh up to it even 800 kilos. These guys remember this time of the year, they really feed on those animals crossing and then they can go for a very long time without eating. Remember, this is coming live from the Masai Mara. Talk to us on hashtag CGTN Wild, hashtag Wild Earth. That's a place you want to ask us questions. I have, you know, other guides, you know, situated in Southern Africa. I have my colleague David somewhere in the Mara. In case I do, cannot answer you, they will be able to answer you. I'm staying here at the river, enjoying the calm sounds of the Mara. Can you hear it? That's the sound of the water that I am getting from where I am. I don't know if you heard it. Yeah, that is the sound. You know, when you stay where I am, if you don't talk, you might snooze, you might sleep. If you don't have something to read, you might snooze. The other residents, the hippos, the same time as now, they are normally out, but today looks like they've gone on strike. Um, actually, I don't see very many of them around here, so I don't know what happened. Maybe yesterday they have a domestic quarrel and they decided that they didn't want to be the dog, you know, to be around. I see only one, but he's very shy. He keeps, you know, showing off his head and then he disappears into the water quite fast. He's somewhere there. James is going to find him for you. He's somewhere there.
have a look at these um, young uh, two cubs right next to each other, you'll notice that the sister has gone and creeped in a little bit closer to the other one. See, her chin's quite close to that bigger female off to the left chin, but this young male, um, early on, it was so cute, he was lying down with his leg over his sister, uh, but they are so relaxed. That other white male came and joined up with uh, the rest of the pride, and he's just lying down between that young male and that big Ross male at the back. But all of them, uh, I, I just, I'm just trying to count, but at l what I can see is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 lions laying, lying down there, right in front of us. Now what I wonder that could have happened here is because today is an overcast day and the wind was blowing quite strong last night, as these lines were probably moving in this area, I just want to see if there's another, oh, there is another line that just got up. That's why they are all lifting their heads just to have a look. But you know how interesting it is? I mean, that line stood up at the back where we can't even see them and immediately these ones knew that there was something happening. It just shows you how alert they are of what's going on around them. But so... When, when they started moving through this dense area, they probably smelled either wildebeest could have been in Yala, uh, something that could, that could have moved into this dense area for a bit of cover out of the wind and out of the cold. And that's when these lions found it. And after that, they decided to come and lie down here. Now, the one cub also picked up its head. See, that's the young male we saw earlier that was feeding. And then the young, oh, all of them lowering down their heads. So he's the only one that has his head up. See how he's picking up his head, pointing his nose forward up into there. That's him just smelling. Remember we had that question earlier about what senses would be the best. So they constantly smell and listen to what's going on around them. The anchor, white lines aren't a common thing to see in the wild. Um, especially in order to get a white lion, both the males and the females have to carry the recessive gene for that white. And, I mean, like if you go and, and research it, there's not a lot of places that you will be able to see it. There are some private reserves that um, will focus on white lions, but in naturally occurring areas, there's very few individuals um, that you'll be able to see, especially with wild pride. Um, in this area, though, there has been records and there has been... Um, mentions of, of some of the Shangans telling the story from one generation to another that they reckon that white lions were seen as far as uh, 400 years ago um, within the area. But uh, what's quite amazing is to be able to see two white lions in one view like we can see now. That's really special and not just, uh, can't just see it just anywhere. So one of the lions in the back is chewing a bone, and that crunching noise is what made all of these lift their heads to have a look. Such a beautiful scene to watch, because you'll notice right next to that yeah, white male, there's another male that's picked up his head with a little bit of fluff around his chin, now those two are the bro are brothers, and it's incredible that that young male decided to go and lie down right next to his brother. It just shows you that bond that they have. And eventually, when they get kicked out of the pride, they most likely will stick together and form a coalition, like these two Ross males. Unless there's other males that also join up, but if they if they, if they get kicked out at the same time, we'll know that they'll be together. Promise there's a green wood hoopoo in there. There we go. I 
I love these birds so much. That bull is so beautiful. Oh, what have you got there? Looks like they're looking for beetle larvae that... Ooh. That grow underneath the bark. Actually look like you might have a bee. Let's see if it, pulls, if it pulls another one out there. It's definitely a beetle larvae. Oh, it's having a great time on this tree. Sometimes I'll rub the insect against the tree to also just kill it, because I suppose it's not nice to have something wiggling as you swallow. You see the little bee eater that we had uh, just earlier does a similar thing, but in order to get the sting off of a bee. Very busy. There they are at the base of that tree. There is the oh, there we go. that work. You can see just why a beak like that is so useful for the type of food that they're after. You can really get it in between the there, just like that, between the outer bark and the inner bark. So busy. I love to watch them. Just love it. Hopefully we'll find some more birds. And we can watch them do their thing too. Hello and welcome back to the Mara. I'm still here at the river. Uh, I'm looking at this yellow bill stock, you know, fishing and getting deeper and deeper into the water. And I'm wondering, is it going to fish or is it going to get fished? It's hard to say. Maybe I'm you know, loading my mind with too much you know, thoughts. Maybe he knows what he's doing. But definitely it's fishing. Looks like it knows though what it's doing because it has retreated back. It's not getting deeper and deeper into the water. And hopefully it survives. On top, left, right, left there, I have two toppies. They're looking like they want to cross, but something has told them, you know, maybe it's too dangerous. It's hard to say anything right now, if they're going to or not. But the main aim they're here is not to drink because there is very, pl you know, plenty of water out there in the plains. So definitely they're here to cross and I'm gonna sit here and wait for them to cross as I get you know soothed by the sounds of the water rapids that little you know miniature waterfall there there are lots of rapids making re making me really sleepy but I'm not sleepy be uh, sleeping because I want to see these guys cross looks like they have decided this is not the crossing they're going to use and they're headed out. James will share that with you. They have decided to head out. Yeah, remember, it's not always that when they come, they will go. 
This river reminds them of a lot of things, dangerous one, dangerous things. They can come and stay there for a minute and then decide um, they're going to go. They can come and decide to go back immediately. So it's always unpredictable. Uh, they're coming back. Okay, at this crossing, nobody is here apart from me. Um, hopefully they do cross. Nothing special about that, but it does happen that you are sometimes alone here at the crossing. Okay, I think I'm going to monitor them and I'm sure if they do cross, my director will give me the privilege to share them with you. Thanks, Isaac. From Topis to Impalas and Nyala into action here in the Great Kruger National Park once again. There's a Nyala bull just exerting his dominance on this herd of Impala. But let's have a look at these two boys in the middle of frame here. Okay, sorry. The middle of the road. There they are. These two male Impala are doing something known as hello grooming. Here we go. I want you to groom my neck right over there. Yes, right there. One will groom, and the other one will reciprocate, normally in the exact same spot. There we go. That's where I want it. Now, it's hard for Impala to groom themselves on their neck. They can pretty much get everywhere else on their body, but the head and neck area is a bit of a tricky place to do. And uh, it's a very important place to groom because that area is often a very, very hot spot for ticks because of the blood network and the potential warmth and so grooming in this form allo grooming forms bonds and also helps for each other to help each other eradicate ticks that possibly ox pickers weren't able to get two little friends here doing what they do two-year-old in parlors or should i say last year's not not last year november but the year november before horns the same size they are the same age there we go right on the forehead the third eye please oh no i want it on the chin <laughs> that's very cool to see this sort of behavior oh a little bit of a cheek And Bernice, they are so social. You'll notice, and that's when we start noticing the end of the official rutting season. Is oh, hang on, there we go. Boys will be boys when the big dominant male in parlor. Actually, the one on the right is younger than the one on the left, only slightly. There's a year difference between those two. You can see the length of the horns. So those boys at the back there, when you see them doing aloe grooming, you know that there's no testosterone left in the in the population they're all quite relaxed that takes some time they get so g'd up those boys competing for females in the early months of the year uh, it takes them months to eradicate those bonds or to should, should i say eradicate that testosterone they're always very sort of standoffish to each other always keeping a little periphery or perimeter around themselves they don't like to be too close to each other but when you do see the older boys grooming like that, then you know everything's relaxed. They're back to normal. Very large herd of impala spread all across the drainage system here. Mixed herd of males and females.
They really are a very, very pretty antelope that I have spent a lot of time with. We have it that that young male decided to pick up his head, but you can see it wouldn't be too long before he just, like, lies down again. Now, often with lions, after a meal, um, and they've had quite a few meals over the last week or so, but then they'll find a nice spot, and this is where they'll rest up for the majority of the day. Now, because it's overcast, there's a good chance that they might rest up only for a couple of hours and then maybe move again. Um, but if, I mean, if you look at the male at the very back, that belly is so big that I'm, not sure, I'm sure it's not going to head anywhere pretty soon. Look at this young female just picking up her head. Now, I wonder where the brother has moved on uh, off to. Oh, he's actually a little bit more to the left. But just so that all our viewers know is that the area where we have found them is really thick. It's a dense area. And the only good view we have of these lines is this little channel that we're looking in right now. So off to the left... There are other lines, but unfortunately, the angle at which we're looking at is just hard. Now, look at this young female coming back. Now, that's the mom that it went to just rub it, her head against. She's probably always going to try to see if she can get a drink. Now, the brother is just behind, or just to the left of where we're looking at her now. Oh. See how they're trying to suckle while she's standing up? Hey Zeus, with the, oh, before I answer that question, look at that <laughs> pull on top of that young male's head. But so normally a pride can, it vary. Sometimes you find individuals. Uh, there was a stage, there was a lioness in Lua, um, which was, or she was all by herself for many years. And eventually the people that started filming her there, and there's a very beautiful documentary about it. Uh, she's attached to them and almost like, um, associated them with the pride until they eventually introduced more lions into that area. So that was a really interesting story, but it could be anywhere from one um, or maybe two because, I mean, one individual won't necessarily be a pride, but it could be a male and female, like two, um, all the way up to a pride of 34, 36, maybe even more lions. Normally when they get to that stage is when they start splitting up. There was a pride, or oh, this particular pride at a stage were close to 32 lions as well, but I know... Uh, there's a pride of 34 lions in Savuti and uh, Botswana. And these lions specialize in hunting elephants. Um, because of the, the, like, the size of the animals that they hunt, they tend to have more. But with a pride like this, they don't necessarily focus on elephants, but they do focus on buffaloes and wildebeest and zebra. And so if the pride is too big, then there's barely any uh, meat for some of the younger members. So then the pride eventually will start splitting up. But it could be, as uh, I would say, a size depends on the amount of food and competition uh, within that area that will be allow the, the pride either to be big or force them to only be a small uh, group of individuals. And you can see his mane is slowly starting to develop into a full mane. Now... Between his ears, there's still a lot of room there for the mane to grow, uh, but underneath, he is getting a very fluffed up mane. And it's normally around this time, uh, for the next two years now, is when his mane is going to start to develop. And I wonder if he, because he's already, I mean, his general, like his size of his head, as well as his paws are bigger than these rice males, if in the next two, three years from now, if he's going to have a bigger, more impressive mane than those two males. Now, his father, just thinking about it, was an impressive male lion, probably one of the biggest that I've seen. And if he grows like that, he will be an impressive male. Welcome back to the woodland of Juma. There's another young Nyala coming through there. You can see the way they walk.
stripes on the body, the mane of fur on the back of the neck, on the shoulders. It's not uncommon to find mixed herds, mixed species herds. Nyala, Impala, Zebra, Kudu, Bushbuck, Giraffe will all hang out together. These two species, Nyala and Impala, are both mixed feeders, so they both do very, very well when the grass is green and then will feed on the leaves and the browse material when that is at its zenith. And then we'll also feed on the leaves that have fallen on the ground, which a lot of the impala are doing now. So that diet switch, that ability to switch a diet, is a very big advantage to an animal that lives in a savanna, <coughs> excuse me, an area that's got grasses and trees. Obviously most of the, the large mammals you find in the Mara are pretty much um, grazers for the most part because of those wide open expanses of grass, nutrient-rich grass that is. But you do find mixed feeders there as well in the form of eland and impala and elephant. But all of them will make hay when the sun shines, feeding on the luscious green grass when it's available. Got a bit of jousting here, BK. These guys are, are playing a bit of a tune these impala males here are doing a bit of practicing. They've gone to the gym to do some sparring with the, the poor little bush. You never want to fight. No heavyweight boxer has ever climbed into the ring without having gone to the gym and practiced his punches, practiced his technique and strengthening and body conditioning. That's what these impala are doing, strengthening their neck, their technique, before they get into a physical confrontation. Yes, exactly, that's what the impalas will do, but the zebras here have a different story because they are eating and some are just playing. And just look in a very small area how many they are. So crowded for two reasons. Number one, there's a lot to eat where they are. The grass here is much shorter from where I was earlier, and there's a lot of water not far from here, from some springs. Not sure what the message that one is trying to send. And exactly that's not grimacing as some of the males or some of the stallions have been known to do. Could be smelling something out in the air. And grimacing is done differently when they're finding out if the females could be in estrus. I didn't see him uh, sniffing any female. It has become quite hot now. And I think after a lot of eating, they would want to bring maybe the body temperatures down or to help in digestion by going to some water point to have a drink. These are the common zebra or the plains zebra. Sometimes we also call them the bachelors zebra. And remember, we have always requested you for questions or comments. Should you have? Now, why I'm saying so, they're very close to some natural water ahead of us, where we have buffaloes in the background, and you know buffaloes also drink lots of water. And between the buffaloes and the zebras is the spring I'm talking about. And so all the big buffaloes in the background there. Now, both these species here are grazers, and that's why they have a commonality, and I think the buffaloes are also enjoying the short green grass. Many species, once in a while, will warm up, just slow down, stop eating, and enjoy the sunshine. 
but you can see there's a bit of discussion maybe going on there and i'm trying to imagine there's so many young uh young bulls there or young males trying to like are this time for them to leave the herd because there's some kind of debate going on there uh, between these zebras here. You can tell that once we have seen huge hearts like this, and then the next time you see them, if you're able to follow them correctly, they'll split, and more often than not, it's the boys that will leave the herd. They look to be in very good condition. If you look on their men, the men is very upright, an indication they are doing very well in terms of feeding, water. Trying to spend a few more minutes here and see if they'll go to have a drink and then maybe follow them up. Welcome back to the river and my topis have totally disappeared out of sight but my crocodiles have been loyal and faithful to me they haven't moved an inch I haven't seen even the slightest movement they are still in the same position so they are just there sleeping Yeah, waiting for something to come by. Oh, here have two hippos. They've decided to come and join them. You see only one on the screen, but there's another one further to the right. Those are two. There's another one. He's going to appear. There we go. Come again. Yeah, he's... I don't know what's happening, but it looks like they have a standoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looks like there's a standoff, definitely. I don't know why, but there could be two males and there's a female coming into season, so they are fighting over it. They are fighting over it, over the female. Yes, all right, it's come to that time where I have to say goodbye. On behalf of CGTN Wild, um, I say thank you on behalf of my directors, uh, my colleagues, uh, my cameraman, I myself, it is goodbye from the Masai Mara. Join us again tomorrow morning. Bye-bye.